caffeinating, but we have a tight schedule to adhere to, and I am a rigid taskmaster. Good morning, and welcome to day two of the rules-based order in Antarctica. I'm Becca Pincus, director of the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, and on behalf of the Wilson Center, the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. State Department, and NOAA, I'd like to thank you to, for coming here today. I want to also thank our program sponsors, Battelle, Lindblad Expeditions, and Herta Gruten for their support. We will kick off this morning with a view from the bridge. We will hear from two icebreaker captains who have led multiple Coast Guard deployments to Antarctica on the Polar Star and the Healy. I'm honored to welcome Captain Ken Boda and Captain Keith Rapella to the stage, along with Commander Phil Boxa, who will moderate this discussion. Gentlemen. Fabulous. Thank you for that introduction. Hey, folks, I'm excited to be here this morning. Again, this is a view from the bridge, Antarctic icebreaking operations. And again, joined to my left is Captain Keith Rapella and Captain Kenneth Boda. Now, Captain Keith Rapella assumed command of the Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star in July of 2022. He has served in his career aboard several cutters, commanding the Coast Guard Cutter Spar, executive officer on the Sycamore, Botwell, and Healy, and of course, ops on the Plantry and the Juniper, in addition to multiple staff assignments ashore. Hailing from Green Bay, Wisconsin, he enlisted in the United States Coast Guard in 1991 and graduated from the United States Coast Guard Academy in 1996. To his left is Captain Ken Boda. And he's the Deputy Director of the Marine Transportation Systems Directorate here at Coast Guard Headquarters at Washington, D.C. Now, from June of 2021 to 2023, he served as the Commanding Officer of Coast Guard Cutter Healy. In addition to serving multiple staff assignments ashore, he served as Executive Officer aboard Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star, Operations Officer aboard Coast Guard Cutter Polar Sea, Training Officer aboard America's Tall Ship, the Coast Guard Cutter Eagle, and as an ice pilot aboard Coast Guard Cutter Polar Sea. Hailing from Fairfield, Connecticut, he graduated from the Coast Guard Academy in 1997. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Phil. Now, my first question is for Captain Rapella. Could you share your perspective as commanding officer of Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star, and having just returned from Operation Deep Freeze this past spring, what that deployment looked like? All right, thank you, Phil, and uh, thank you, Becca, for the invite and for the Wilson Center for hosting us. Uh, just comment on yesterday's presenters and, and panelists were fantastic. It was very entertaining and educational. We'll try and keep that going uh, as best we can this morning. Um, first, just a brief overview of Polar Star and her mission. Uh, she is the heavy icebreaker for the United States. And right now, her main goal is to uh, break the path uh, for uh, resupply of McMurdo Station down in Antarctica. 13-ton uh, ship and uh, 140, 150 crew. And we generally leave each year from our home port in Seattle uh, mid-October, uh, sorry, mid-November, work our way down uh, to Antarctica, stopping in a few places for logistics. Uh, we usually leave that last port of call somewhere a little bit before Christmas, and then uh, we're on our own on the way down. Um, we're going to have a little uh, perspective up there behind us, I think, uh, so you can see what we're talking about a little bit. But uh, yeah, we're almost a single mission sh uh, vessel now, which is kind of rare in the Coast Guard, but Ken's actually going to talk about uh, a few a few diversions from that uh, in a little bit. Um, and uh, as, as Phil mentioned, I have about 13 years underway, uh, four of those years uh, dealing a little bit in the Arctic, but this last year was my first trip down to Antarctica and doing this mission to break out McMurdo, and uh, what an amazing adventure. Um, so much fun, so challenging and rewarding all at the same time, and uh, oh, here we go. Um, so this is a little perspective. Uh, first of all, it's south up. So uh, South Pole is on the top, uh, and on the left is a larger view of the greater McMurdo Sound with Ross Island up in the, nor up in the upper left-hand corner uh, in McMurdo. You can see McMurdo Station on the peninsula up there. Laser things even. Watch this. So there's McMurdo uh, and, and Ross Island. 
Uh, and then this also shows the two main types of ice that we deal with down there, the pack ice, which is the stuff that's broken up and kind of floating around, and then the fast ice up here uh, in McMurdo. This was, uh, this is actually two days old, uh, yeah, about a week old. So uh, we started getting uh, some new imagery here as, as the light starts shining on Antarctica this, this, uh, this time of year. So this is a very recent picture of what it looks like down there. Uh, that fast ice for reference up there is about 40 miles from, from McMurdo down to this edge of the fast ice here. Uh, uh, let's see. So mostly we, uh, we just work our way down there and, and pick our way through that, uh, that uh, pack ice and one of the kind of rules of ice breaking is to avoid ice when you can. So, uh, so we'll pick our way through the fast ice. There's some uh, open plenias in every that we try to pick our way through to to really get to that fast ice, and that's where we make our money. Uh, so, uh, on the on this right hand side, this was our the work we did last year, uh, and that fast ice is only about 15 miles long last year. So, uh, already we <laughs> nothing changes. We got a little bit more work to do this year, but. Last year was about 15 miles of that fast ice, and uh, most of that averaged about six feet. Uh, still waiting to see how thick, how thick the stuff is this year. But uh, our goal is really to to plow that path after, just like if you're opening up a road after winter, we're plowing that path, uh, and and so and so. Um, Dr. Uh, Lub uh, Lubchenko, in her opening comments yesterday, talked about being able to uh, to get to a lead and having orcas come up, I you know, feet from her. Uh, well, we're actually creating leads. So guess what? The whales come, uh, and and uh, so especially that first cut that we're coming in there, and we usually try to stop and uh, get out on the ice and play a little bit. But uh, but the whales follow us in too and play and uh, look for food, of course. But um, so we're creating those leads, and those whales come up right behind us. It's it's an incredible opportunity, uh, and we've got some some uh, amateur photographers that are on board and take some fantastic photos. So I'll just plug uh, Niall Shannon was one of our crewmates. He uh, he's got a uh, Instagram site. Uh, I don't do Instagram, but his his I think his handle, if that's what you call it, is uh, Niall's Niall Crocodile. Look it up. Uh, he's got some fantastic stuff and. And then the Polar Stars Facebook page, we put some pretty cool stuff on there too, but some footage of what we get to see and do, and a little bit more of details of life on board Polar Star, but, but uh, fantastic stuff. Um, but that, that mission, once we get to the fast ice, that takes about two weeks to groom that channel, and really we're just running that line back and forth, making it a little bit wider, making it a little bit softer, so the container ships uh, and, and uh, tankers can get, up, get in there and uh, tie up to the pier and do what they need to do. Uh, and like I said, usually that, that fast ice is where we make our money and where Polar Star, uh, but, but Polar Star is really designed to, to do well. But last year was kind of unique in, even though as we talked about yesterday, uh, the pack ice concentration overall in Antarctica was less, it all seemed to be in McMurdo Sound last year. So. <laughs> Uh, so, so all that pack ice outside of this area, like this, this hopefully kind of opens up a little more by the time we get there. But there was so much pack ice in here uh, that we really struggled through, and that was some. Uh, usually, that that fast ice is pretty consistently six feet smooth, and we can we can drive through that pretty well. But uh, but that pack ice, because uh, it crashes together and and uh, refreezes and, and bangs together, creates some huge ridges and just gets super concentrated and hard to get through. So if you can't pick through it, you gotta drive through it. And uh, some of that stuff was really hard this year. And uh, my operations officer who put this slideshow together, he's got, he's got like a six hour presentation he can give you if you really want. And we can extend the conference for a day and, and he'll talk the whole day about, about this stuff and the ice concentrations and why. And he's, He's really good at that stuff, but um, but <laughs> but really we struggled through this and had to escort our uh, our three container ships through through this area 
and usually they don't need that help uh, through the pack ice. They can just kind of pick their way through because it's open enough. But, but last year, we, we, that was actually the hard part was the, the pack ice. And uh, they, they actually enjoyed, once they got to the fast ice over there, uh, it was kind of a relief for them. But, uh, so um, we got all, we had, last year we had three container ships. Uh, this year we'll have uh, a, a, f a fueling tanker and another and two container ships um, coming in. So um, we'll be coming out of our dry dock here and we're actually in dry dock in Vallejo right now. We'll float in a few weeks, in a couple weeks and head to our home port in Seattle for a couple days, uh, a little less than a month, and then start, start our way back down. Um, the whole journey takes about five months, home port to home port or dry dock, which, <laughs> which is our normal case. Uh, and what else do we want to know? Um, a little bit about McMurdo once they get there. I don't know if, if anybody's been if everybody's been down there or see see how this happens, but they create this ice pier down there, and it's it's a little bit of a misnomer, but not really. It's actually made of ice and dirt and rebar. other rebar and other things that they they kind of create a a 400 by 200 box in the ice, and they start filling it with these layers to create. Uh, this year, it said it's about a 400 by 200 and 20 feet deep of this solid mass of stuff uh, it's pretty amazing uh engineering but uh so that's where the uh the crew, the container ships will tie up and will tie up on occasion um uh but this last year so that that creation lasts two or three years and then it it uh it gets weak enough that they can't use it anymore and they'll have to build another one but in the meantime they'll bring down this mobile or uh, modular causeway that i think the army corps and uh, owns, so they'll rent it from the Army Corps, and they'll bring it in on one of those ships, offload it, and build it next to the ship, and then plant it uh, on the shore, and then they can tie up to that. So that's what they did this last year, and uh, we did got to do some other kind of cool things like tow that ice pier out of the way. Um, so uh, always looking for new and fun, uh, fun projects to do while we're down there, but um, that was one of them. Uh, Another unique thing we got to do this last year uh, is usually on the way on the way down, on the way back, we kind of stay in the Pacific uh, and hit uh, Australia, New Zealand, and, and, and a couple other places on the way to and from. Uh, but this last year, we had the opportunity to go uh, the South American route and stop and stop in Palmer Station for the first time in about 37 years. It was a regular stop for Polar Star, Polar Sea uh, on all of their missions right up until 87, I believe. And uh, part of that mission was actually to fuel them. So we'd anchor in this little cove and run fuel hoses up to Palmer Station so we could refuel them. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. They got some other folks to do that for them. But we stopped by and, and uh, got to visit them for the first time in 37 years this last year. And, uh, they were excited to have some visitors, uh, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, and it was exciting for us to get up there and get up to the peninsula, which is absolutely, I mean, all of Antarctica is beautiful. I recommend going. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the peninsula is amazing. And, uh, and then we got to go through, um, got to visit a couple spots in Chile and go through the Patagonia Pass, which also beautiful. Uh, and I haven't done that in a while either. But, uh, um, yeah, so Palmer Station was a mission we used to do, don't do anymore. Uh, and then because, because of Polar Star's age, uh, we also go to, like I mentioned, we go to Dry Dock. We go to Dry Dock every year now. Uh, that hasn't been the case when she was younger, but uh, because it's the only asset that, could, that can go down there, uh, we want to keep her um, healthy enough to keep doing that. So we put her into Dry Dock every year for some preventive maintenance. and. Uh, um, so that kind of limits what we can do. That's why I said we're a kind of a single mission ship now. Uh, and there have been other options like uh, some of the treaty inspection, you know, uh, facilitating treaty inspections and some other missions, uh, but kind of limited in the amount of time we have down there, so kind of limited in that. But uh, sometimes opportunities present themselves uh, for other missions, and uh, Ken has been down there a lot more than one time and has uh, a 
a few more experiences he can share with us. So go ahead, Ken. Awesome. Thank you, Keith. I, I have a few slides, too, uh, just to give you some visual aids. But uh, yeah, so I've, uh, I've done a lot of uh, Antarctic time. I've done five different deep freezes. Uh, I think two on Polar Sea, two on Polar Star, and one on Nathaniel Palmer. So it was a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool experience along the way. Um, if you could go, oh, I guess I got to go backwards here. Okay. Um, so my last, uh, my last icebreaker tour was just, uh, I just came off in June, and I was the commanding officer of uh, the Coast Guard Cutter Healy, uh, which be, we've been pretty much focusing Healy in the Arctic these days. Um, I had the opportunity, very rare opportunity, to go to the North Pole. And uh, while we're at the North Pole, um, some of you may know Sarah Kay. She's been around the icebreaker program for a long time. She did some time at South Pole Station. And uh, she knew some folks at South Pole and said, hey, we need to link up North Pole to South Pole. And uh, one of the guys at South Pole said, hey, you know, um, one thing that we could do is make an Earth sandwich. So uh, this is our bread on the North Pole. <laughs> and uh, here's, here's the South Pole bread. So uh, it's been done before, I'm told. Usually it's an open face sandwich, right? And they, they put one and then they go later. But this happened at the same time. So it was really cool to talk to them and, and a lot of fun that way. So. Um, so my first trip down to Antarctica was 1998. I was a brand new uh, young ensign out of the Coast Guard Academy, and I didn't know anything of what was going on, but I was learning a lot. And as we were coming out of McMurdo after the break-in, um, this motor vessel Green Wave uh, was one of the contracted container ships that the uh, NSF used. And in the Southern Ocean, which um, as many of you know is not a real hospitable place, um, they had a big engine uh, problem. They, they uh, had a, a big piston problem on one of their engines and, and it seized up. So they were disabled and drifting. Uh, so we picked up the tow of, uh, of uh, motor vessel Green Wave and we, uh, we towed her through the Southern Ocean uh, for about a week and a half. Um, and uh, as a, uh, it, was, it was a pretty neat opportunity because we got to go into Christchurch, New Zealand, which doesn't happen too, too often back then. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the trip to Christchurch was a lot of fun, and, uh, you know, so that was kind of my first experience. I'm like, oh, we must do this every time, right? This, this is amazing. Um, well, as it turns out, I, I, I did two more search and rescue cases in my career. Um, we were sitting in Sydney, Australia. It was, uh, it was uh, beautiful right after New Year's, and uh, we got a report. Um, that the academic Shulkowski got stuck in the ice, if you remember this, up off the Delhi coast area. And um, that, was, uh, that was interesting. So we were sitting and waiting and, and hearing. And we heard about it before we tied up in Sydney. And we had to get fuel. Um, so we were waiting there. And uh, we got a call. Um, oh, Shui Long, the Chinese vessel, went down to uh, help him out. And guess what? They got stuck too. So now it's like, wait, there's a Russian? and a Chinese icebreaker stuck in the ice. And here we are in Polar Star in Sydney. So um, we, got a, we got a request from the uh, Rescue Coordination Center in Australia to get underway, mobilize, and go down and, uh, and help them out. Uh, so we got underway. And typically, we try and pick our passage through the Southern Ocean uh, for as good a ride as possible, trying to dodge storms. But now we have a rescue case, so we tried to do a beeline. And you could see. Uh, um, you can see some of the uh, result of that was uh, getting our butts kicked, literally. Uh, we, we had some flooding. We, uh, we uh, broke one of the landing craft that we had on board. And uh, just before we got down there, probably about two days out, uh, the winds changed, and they were able to free themselves both. Um, the, the environmentals changed, and, and they got out. So it was, uh, it was kind of disappointing. We're like, oh, man, it would have been amazing. So um, yeah, so we didn't get to be the heroes that day. but. The next year we went down, and uh, it was a little different case, uh, fishing vessel Antarctic Chieftain. Um, so we were heading out of McMurdo once again, um, and we were going to go along the Ross Ice Shelf and towards uh, Valparaiso, Chile, to do a, to do a call there. Um, the Antarctic Chieftain was an Australian vessel uh, fishing. Uh, they had 25 crew members and two observers from the, uh, the Australian government on board, and they got stuck in some... Uh, pretty gnarly ice. Um, I, I was reading the report just to kind of refresh my memory, and uh, I've got a couple videos here. I don't know. Are they built into this? No. Um, if we could uh, play one of the videos. You got it? Yeah. Play the first one, please. <coughs> 
So this is a video that our Coast Guard uh, public affairs specialist took of us trying to pick up the toe of, uh, of the Antarctic chieftain. So here we are shooting a line throwing gun over to the boat. The tow line's paid out on the flight deck here, you can see. Once we start driving, we uh, use an ax to chop uh, small stuff that's holding the towing hauser and we feed that back to the, sh to the boat. So we're taking the strain on the tow line and uh, as it turned out, they got stuck in this ice and, uh, and they had a, a single propeller and three of the blades were bent pretty bad. We had an ROV on board and, and uh, put it underneath to take a look. So just to kind of get an idea of what we were feeling at the time, I, I was interviewed uh, by CNN, I, and we've got that video queued up here too, so you can, uh, you can see this. Extreme weather is slowing down the U.S. military rescue of an Australian fishing crew whose boat is stuck in the ice near Antarctica. The Coast Guard sent one of its largest ships to help. Now that ship, called the Polar Star, is inching closer to this trapped vessel. Commander Kenneth Boda is on board that Coast Guard cutter, and he joins me now on the phone. Uh, Commander, thank you so much for joining us. We understand you just reached uh, this fishing boat. What kind of weather have you been facing before getting to this point? Uh, good afternoon. We've been, uh, we've been battling a few little snowstorms here and there. Uh, the challenge right now is the ice coverage. We're in uh, about 100% ice coverage. Six foot of ice with two feet of snow on top, uh, rafted blocks of ice all around us. And everywhere you look, there's big tabular icebergs. So it's been a pretty, pretty difficult slog through the ice to get to the fishing vessel Arctic Chieftain today. And how far away are you from the fishing vessel? Right now, we're probably about 100 yards away from the fishing vessel. We have our bow uh, right up alongside her pilot house, and we pass the line between the fishing vessel and us. Oh, that's great. Now, there are 26 people on board uh, the fishing vessel stuck in the ice, about 900 miles from Antarctica. Three of their four propellers uh, don't work. How much danger would they have been in? Well, really, we're a pretty powerful icebreaker, and we're really the only one around. I think if we weren't here, they would have to wait for a serious shift in wind, and that might not come. They, they could potentially have to have wintered over without us showing up here. Oh, my God. So uh, the Polar Star, uh, as you know, is one of the strongest ice vessels in the world. I, 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 it sounds as though you believe you're going to be able to save this fishing crew. Absolutely. You know, that's what the Coast Guard does. We save lives and we save property. And this is uh, just a little part of our mission, of course, but we, uh, we're always there for mariners in peril on the sea. Commander, once you do save this Australian crew, it's my understanding you have 130 crew members of your own in what I imagine are fairly tight quarters. Do you have space on your own ship to accommodate this new group? Well, we have 150 people on board right now, and we, uh, we will definitely make room for whoever we need if uh, we do have to evacuate the vessel. Uh, we're hoping to be able to escort this vessel out of the ice, though. All right, Commander Kenneth Boda, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. I know you're busy, and uh, best of luck finishing up that important rescue mission. I appreciate it, Jake. <laughs> All right. So uh, this was, you know, kind of exciting, right? We're going to have a rescue. We're actually there. We're on scene. We're taking this boat out. We, we towed it uh, about 100 miles through loose pack, and um, it probably added about or took out about 10 years of my life, and all these gray hairs are mostly a result. It was one of the scariest things I'd ever done. Um, driving from the aloft con, from the high, uh, high conning area, um, looking back at this vessel behind us on a little tow line, and uh, we would come, the flows would move around us and then fill in behind us. And then the vessel would come and hit the flow and go, or, or, you know, either side. It was, it was ridiculously scary. Every time I was up there, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I hope they don't capsize. It was, uh, it was crazy. But um, we did get them out of the ice. We got them uh, up uh, into the Southern Ocean. They actually had another fishing boat up there that we passed uh, the tow on to. Um, so it was, uh, again, I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. The Australian government's going to like, you know, have like Polar Star Day and they're going to have a parade next time we're down there. Yeah, 
we heard nothing after this. It was just like <laughs> silence on the lines. So I don't know if they weren't they didn't want to talk about fishing down there or what it was, but uh, you know it was uh, it was uh, in the heat of the moment. It seemed like a, a pretty amazing thing. So um, these search and rescues are going to happen as we see more and more vessels are down there. Um, the risk increases, people are gonna do things. Th this vessel had no business being where they were. They were 100 miles of ice between them and open water. So they picked their way through a loose pack and then the pack kind of turned and, and uh, pretty much pinned them in. And they would, I, I really do believe they would have wintered over. Um, okay, another, uh, another big challenge I saw, uh, I was actually on board the Palmer at the time as a grad student. Uh, you know, work in the CTD, but um, I did get a chance to see uh, this iceberg B-15. Um, this iceberg calved off the Ross Ice Shelf, and as we learned yesterday, this event is happening more and more often. Um, it grounded right outside of McMurdo Sound. Where's the laser on this guy? Oh, now I did it. <laughs> there we go. All right, so um, McMurdo's down here, and this Here's the Ross Ice Shelf, and the, uh, the berg kind of clogged up uh, McMurdo Sound. So what happened was now the circulation uh, didn't allow that ice to melt, melt and break down. So what's typically a 15-mile break-in now becomes a 100-mile break-in. Um, this happened in 2002, and the berg was there for about three years um, before it finally ungrounded and drifted out. You can see its path here. 2006, it made it up that way. Um, so these environmental changes can happen very quickly. Um, the, the beating that both Polar Sea and Polar Star took in that time really uh, quickly deteriorated the material condition of both ships. Um, it was such a hard slog to do that deep freeze. And uh, there were a couple of years we didn't even get to the pier, and we were actually offloading onto the fast ice um, because it was so difficult. So um, Now, you might ask, what does that iceberg look like? I, I mean, it looked like a coastline when you sailed up alongside of it. You, it just, I mean, it, I think it's, they said it was the size of Jamaica. So you can imagine, it's tall, and it's, uh, it just looks like a coastline that you sail along. It's pretty, pretty unbelievable. So again, these environmental changes are things that we're going to see more and more. And maybe what you think, you know, oh, the ice is melting. Do you need icebreakers? Well, absolutely, you might, you know, and this is one of the reasons why. OK, uh, one of the other things we've done before uh, is a Marble Point uh, refuel. Marble Point is a helicopter uh, outpost um, along, the, along the coast in, uh, in the Ross Sea. And um, we've done a lot of work at Marble Point through the years. Uh, when I was an ensign, we offloaded a ton of um, old hazardous waste, old oil and things. And uh, this particular year, I think, yeah, it was a 2014, we delivered a new hose uh, to Marble Point. Uh, you know, to, uh, to lay that out. So these icebreakers, I mean, we're, we're self-contained. We have a, a lot of fuel, 1.3 million gallons of diesel. Uh, we have a bunch of aviation fuel, and we can bring that wherever we need to go in Antarctica along the coast. Um, we, uh, we have landing craft, uh, so if there's, a, uh, if there's a group that needs to go ashore, uh, we can deliver them certainly there. Um, you know, there's, uh, they're very capable uh, ships. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit in, in future panels about the polar security cutter and, and what, uh, what kind of capabilities that will bring. But, um, you know, the mission is planned and out, and, you know, we're planning the mission already for uh, next year uh, for deep freeze. And uh, sometimes these unexpected things happen, and, and we've got to roll with it and be prepared. So, all right, that's all I got. Thank you, Captain Boda and Captain Rapella, for your stories about the southern continent there. Uh, Captain Rapella, I, I can only imagine the sights and the sounds punching through that ridged ice covered in snow, areas of compression, and the challenge that it can be. Also, I, I can also uh, you know, try to imagine, you know, I, th I think I've seen a couple of National Geographic specials maybe, with those minke whales and you know, orcas like, you know, just playing in your wake as you go along. Thank you for describing that trip. I can also imagine the anxiety of mooring a 13,000 ton icebreaker against a pier made of ice <laughs> um, with no tugs, nothing but you uh, maneuvering alongside. Um, and again, this, this cadence between operations and then subsequently coming back and the heavy maintenance that needs to get done. Captain Boda, thank you for limiting your stories to the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, you snuck one in there with the, uh, the world sandwich there, and well done. We'll, we'll leave your uh, historic transit through the Northwest Passage for another day. Uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you know, thank you again for uh, you know, going through those unexpected operational challenges and opportunities uh, during your many sorties to the Antarctic continent. Now, gentlemen, to wrap things up, 
Uh, you know, it, in your view, and I'm starting with you, Captain Rapella, uh, what is the future role of the United States Coast Guard in Antarctica? I think it's going to be the same and uh, probably grow back to what it also used to be. Uh, there's always going to be the, the need to, to resupply uh, McMurdo and, uh, and increase that infrastructure down there that we heard about yesterday. Um, and I think we can, w especially once the, the PSCs come online and they are a little more robust and have the time and capacity to do it, uh, go back to some of those other missions uh, like uh, treaty uh, inspections, uh, supporting treaty inspections, uh, maybe some fisheries, uh, fisheries inspections and boardings as well. But increase the, the, co the missions that the Coast Guard already does. Uh, I think more of those are going to creep down south and uh, we're going to continue to do those down there. Perfect. And uh, Captain Boda, your thoughts? Yeah, a, a uh, Coast Guard ship is many things. It's a warship, um, but it's also a very capable vessel. And the authorities of the Coast Guard that we bring um, really, you know, on the constabulatory side as well as the military side uh, allow us to do a lot of, lot of things. So, um, you know, I, I think... Uh, we often talk about, you know, the Coast Guard, if it's wet, we have some sort of authority to be there and do that. Um, and, and that's absolutely true. And I think as you see more and more tourism, uh, as you see increased um, need for logistics as uh, our, our foreign partners are building out, uh, you know, more in the Antarctic as the science uh, demand becomes bigger, I think we'll just see the need for icebreakers and, uh, and the need for icebreaker deployments increase. And with the polar security cutters, if, uh, you know, as we're, as we're building them out, if we uh, do get to our, uh, our sweet spot of three heavy icebreakers and three mediums, I think we'll be able to do a lot of things in Antarctica we haven't thought about. Uh, beyond just the McMurdo breakout, maybe we could do a winter trip to Antarctica. Maybe we can go into the Wet LC. Um, you know, one of the really gnarliest places down there. So um, those are kinds of things that I think the future holds for Coast Guard icebreaking. Well, thank you, gentlemen, Captain Rapella, Captain Boda, for that view from the bridge, Antarctic icebreaker operations. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, your panel, thank you very much. that was the highlight for the day. Um, thank you, gentlemen. That was outstanding. I am now honored to introduce our first panel of the day on tourism, access, safety, and awareness. We will be joined by Peter Young, a documentary filmmaker known for The Last Ocean, Gina Marie Greer, director of the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, or IATO, and Claire Christian, director of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, ASOC, a coalition of NGOs working to protect Antarctica and uphold the Antarctic Treaty System. I will be moderating. Just, just a, I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off. Thank you. Um, thank you, panel. I am really looking forward to this discussion of awareness and access in Antarctica. I'd like to kick us off by asking Peter to talk about awareness raising and his visits to Antarctica to document issues there. Can you talk about your work, Peter? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, um, Rebecca, and to the Wilson Center for um, inviting me here and to be on this panel and add to this discussion. Um, it's an honor to be here with so many Antarctic experts. I'm an independent filmmaker, I'm working mostly in documentaries. I'm from New Zealand. I've had a long-standing connection with Antarctica and in particular the Ross Sea. As a filmmaker, I'm more of a generalist, not an expert, but I do talk to lots of experts along the way. I generally edit out the ums and the ahs and the maybes and I make them sound even more expert than the expert they are. Um, it's an incredibly privileged position and uh, it's something that I've loved right from day one, talking to these people. Uh, one of the questions that Rebecca sent to us was how do media communication tools play a role in enabling virtual access for those who are not able or choose not to visit Antarctica. Um, 
I thought the best way to answer this was to share one of my Antarctic adventures with you called The Last Ocean. And as Rebecca said, it involves a film and a public campaign um, to protect the Ross Sea in Antarctica. I'm squeezing 10 long years into five short minutes, Rebecca, for you. Thank you, Peter. Um, this adventure began for me 15 years ago with a knock at the door. Um, sorry, I'll just have to answer that. At the time, I was uh, working as a freelance documentary cameraman based in Christchurch, New Zealand on sort of wildlife and nature documentaries. Um, I'd worked on the Blue Planet for BBC. I had done two giant squid films um, for Discovery and, and many more. Um, sort of documentaries. Uh, behind the door was a Colorado photographer and I'd never met him. His name was John Weller. I'm not too sure if John's made it here, but oh, here he is, John. Um, anyway, uh, by the time Johnny arrived in Christchurch, he was on a mission. Uh, he had read a paper, a scientific paper written by legendary Antarctic ecologist, Dr. Dave Ainley. Now, Dave described the Ross Sea as the most intact, untouched ocean ecosystem on Earth. But the natural balance of that ecosystem was under threat from a recently established commercial fishery, initiated by New Zealand, my country, but it had grown to uh, involve 12 different nations, and they were targeting Antarctic toothfish, which is a key predator in that Ross Sea ecosystem. Um, the Antarctic toothfish, by the way, makes its way and is sold here in uh, most of the catch in North America as Chilean sea bass. So there was John. He was inviting me to the Ross Sea to film the wildlife for this project called The Last Ocean. Um, there was no pay. We had a ticket, two tickets on a tourist ship and uh, a four-week excursion. Uh, what John didn't realise when he turned up at my doorstep is that I'd actually been to Antarctica before. Uh, nearly 40 years ago, I went down and I worked in McMurdo Station as a, uh, an underwater ceramic technician. Yeah, and other people called us dishwashers. <laughs> <laughs> I worked um, four months there and uh, eight hours a day, six days a week, and on that seventh day we'd go out into the expanse of the Ross Sea and uh, that's where I really fell in love with the place. And so when John arrived offering me this opportunity to go down, of course I said yes. Um, sorry, here is the page. There we go, on the, on the um, Ross Ice Barrier. On that trip, uh, John and I met up with Dave Ainley. He was studying penguins at um, Cape Roy's, and we agreed to work together on the Last Ocean Project. Our aim was to raise awareness of the pristine qualities, to try and halt the commercial fishing, and to get the entire region protected. Um, none of us had done anything like this before and we were dealing in a situation where 99.9% .9 of the population we were um, targeting didn't even know where the Ross Sea was. It was a big, bold idea. But we took it one step at a time. Um, is there some water? No. We'll get you some water. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, after filming in the Ross Sea, the first thing that we did um, was set up a Last Ocean Charitable Trust in Christchurch. Then I travelled to Kamla to get an understanding of the politics and um, just where we'd have to go if we wanted um, decisions to be made. Um, our core team grew to include uh, Cassandra Brooks, who we all heard from yesterday, and uh, I think she must have enjoyed her time amongst us because she ended up marrying John. <laughs> thank you, thank you. My wife, Tracy, back in New Zealand, also provided a huge amount of support. Hmm, that's better. Um, but we ran this campaign basically out of our garages. Um, John and 
Boulder, Colorado, us in New Zealand. We pounded the pavement in our respective countries. We spoke to the public. We talked to the politicians. Um, and um, we just started building our community, the last ocean community. Now, a couple of years after this very hard graft, we gained the attention and the support from the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition. Uh, thank you, Claire and Jim, for doing that. Um, and um, other NGOs joined in, Pew, Greenpeace, WWF, and they added their much needed weight, experience and strategy to our grassroots campaign. We got traction. Not long after that, the United States and the New Zealand government began working on separate MPA proposals which were tabled at Kamla in 2011. Kamla discussed this and asked them to return with a joint proposal in 2012. So that was going to be a big year. It was a deadline that Kamla had set itself to have created a network of marine protected areas around Antarctica. We were hoping to call them to task and just have them create one in the Ross Sea, for the time being one. Our public campaign the, um, was in full swing and in that year, in 2012, we released the film. Uh, it, it, it condensed the five years of our campaigning and all our reasoning into 87 minutes. I'll just um, play the trailer for you. R-O-S-S, -S -S. Rossi, yeah. Rossi. Oh, I've never heard of it. Is it the east side, west side of New York City? The Ross Sea, Antarctica, is the most pristine marine ecosystem on Earth. As you're moving down towards the Ross Sea, it gets richer and richer. You have this sense of it growing, and you're about to witness a true concert of life. It, the fact that it's so pristine would mean that it has certain kinds of values. It is a chance to understand a system that is operating fully functionally. It's really hard to find these places today. You know, most places on Earth have been pretty severely changed by humans. You know, you can't be a doctor of, of the oceans without knowing what a healthy patient looks like. You know, it's a very tight food web. And anything that changes in one part of it affects another. So here it was on a cliff above the Ross Sea at Cape Crozier on Ross Island. Along comes this blue fishing vessel. Right? begins to deploy a long line. I mean, the idea that there'd be commercial fishing in the Ross Sea, would, I would not have believed it. Our approach was, we will make the case for fishing in the Ross Sea, but only on the most strict precautionary basis. I, mean, I always think of New Zealand as an eco-friendly country. The toothfish produced a gold rush mentality. The hours of the market is one in the morning to nine in the morning. Those are the market hours. These are six to eight kilo fish. This is probably the most popular size. There's no socially redeeming value about taking a toothfish out and uh, serving it up on a platter to people in the most expensive restaurants in North America. I mean, what is that? Have you heard of Chilean sea bass? I have, yes. They're sending it here and yeah. we're eating it? They are exploited the way you would exploit a seam of coal. To ruin an entire ecosystem just for the few people who are wealthy and like to eat toothfish is a really sad thing. We can't just go in and identify a keystone species and just yank it all out and expect the ecosystem to keep working. The true cost for ordering toothfish in a New York restaurant is that essentially you're destroying an ecosystem. We have a chance to protect it or to lose it forever. Well, the film did come. <laughs> it came and went, and uh, Kamla came and went, and uh, in that year in 2012, with no result, uh, it took another four years of hard negotiating for it to happen. It was time for Evan and his team to do the hard graft. And um, they did it and they did it well, along with the New Zealand delegation and other supporting nations. Because as we know, in 2016, history was made and the largest MPA in the world, in the, uh, in the Ross Sea, was created. 
It was a fantastic outcome. From its humble grassroots beginning to the international movement it became through to the highest levels of diplomatic negotiations. The success lay in the commitment at every level from everyone working in those levels. While the final decisions were made in Kamla, I believe the foundations were set in the public campaign that got the ball rolling. It was a story that took viewers from the wilds of the Ross Sea to the politics of Kamla, the markets of New York and Seoul and Japan. It played in over 50 film festivals. Um, it won a dozen awards. It played at a special screening at National Geographic where the Secretary of State John Kerry spoke. And it was given to every delegation around the Kamla table. It is living proof of the important role that media can play in Antarctica's future. The film will connect people to a place that is a million miles away from their everyday lives and importantly it will connect them enough to care. It will hold politicians accountable. I'd like to think it would hold Kamla accountable. That may be a bridge too far. <laughs> One final point I'd like to make, actually I forgot to acknowledge um, Dave Ainley and um, the group amazing group of Rossi scientists that created a um, really solid foundation of science and facts for that campaign. Um, I'd also like to say that with our open opposition to commercial fishing, um, my chances of getting down under New Zealand's Antarctic program were very slim and understandably so. John and I went down on a uh, tourist ship and it was tourism that gave us the freedom to to travel there, to tell this story, and um, to carry forward that big, bold idea. So uh, thank you for listening. That's a perfect segue, I think, into the next part of the talk. Thank you so thank much. Thank you Peter. very much. Thank you for sharing that great story. Um, next, I'd like to ask Gina uh, to talk about IADO and the ways in which tourism access to Antarctica is managed and has changed over the years. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the Wilson Center for having us and Becca for inviting us. Uh, we first met in Rhode Island, I think it was about two years ago, uh, where Becca started talking then about this idea of bringing everyone together to talk about these issues. So for us, it's an honor to be here today. It's hard to follow up um, uh, behind Peter's video, especially a video as powerful as that one. Uh, so I'm actually going to talk about my mom uh, before I talk about IATO. And the reason why I'm starting with it is that it's my mom that opened my eyes to the possibility or the opportunity to go to Antarctica as a tourist. In 1995, uh, my mom, who is a budget traveler, she's always been very savvy at finding the best deals and, and being able to see this amazing planet we have, had the opportunity to go to Alaska. And while in Alaska, she was taken away and absolutely amazed by the ice. The beautiful glaciers that we have and the colors, especially the blues, the vibrant blues. While on that trip, someone had pulled her aside and said, if you think this is amazing, <laughs> you need to see Antarctica. My mom, like I said, budget traveler. So she spent quite a bit of time researching, looking at the options, and also saving. It was a 10-year plan for her, where she put money aside every year and she made certain decisions because this is somewhere she wanted to go. On Christmas Day in 2005, after eating dinner with the family, we brought her to the airport and off she went on to her adventure. To say the trip changed her is an understatement. The impact of the landscape and the wildlife and being able to connect in it in a much different way than the concrete jungle that many of us live in definitely impacted her when she came back and she recognized and realized the importance of protecting areas such as this and the responsibility we have beyond our local community. Of course, that inspired me after hearing and seeing her images, which at the time were on film, not digital. And so in 2018, I went myself, January of 2018. 
And that's when I was fully introduced to IATO, or the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators. My relationship with IATO began before I left home. There was information that was sent to us regarding responsible tourism, things we needed to think about, what we were going to pack and bring, and the responsibilities that we had once we got down there. Once we got on the vessel, conversation continued. Lots of lectures and talks regarding the wildlife and what to expect, how we were to behave down there, and also the infamous cleaning parties, vacuum parties, mudroom parties. Every vessel has a different name for it. But in essence, it's where you bring all your gear down and you go through a massive cleaning session where the field staff will take your gear and they search through it. They are looking for any sort of invasive species that might have hitchhiked into your pockets, your Velcro, and into your linings. For myself and my fellow travelers, it helped set the stage for where we were going. We recognized and knew the importance and the responsibility we had once we were down there. The thing that amazed me when I talked, whether it was to the crew or to the field staff, was the role that IATO played in relation to what was going on. And there was a definite pride in their voice when they talked about their part in IATO and their commitment, not only to their guests, but to their community, being the Antarctic community, and to the environment. So let me talk about IATO. One of the big surprises that I had when I uh, learned more about IATO is that it's not some sort of government agency. It is a trade association made up of, quite honestly, competitors. But their ultimate goal in working together is to advocate and promote safe and environmentally responsible travel to Antarctica. This has come over the course of 30 years when seven operators got together and realized that they collectively had quite a bit of knowledge and perspective regarding how to execute on that mission. Today, we're over 108 members, which include operators and now associates. Associate members are typically the members that help support us in a variety of different ways, whether it's through the travel agency process, ship agents, procurement, and even a few NGOs. The interesting thing about IATO, and this is where people usually get into quite a debate when they talk about limiting numbers, and I will talk about growth in a minute, but the interesting debate that tends to occur is that IATO doesn't regulate. We manage. We manage what treaty party members authorize and permit the author operators to do. Now, how we manage it, if you look at the screen, you can see what our makeup is. The secretariat, which I'm a part of, there's 12 of us, right? 12 of us. But the management really comes from the operators, and it comes from the work and the advocacy and the participation that they've all given over the course of the 30 years across currently 12 committees and eight working groups. Our members are very vocal. Um, there are days where that's great, and I'll tell you there are days where it's a little bit of a challenge for me, but it really helps bring us to who we are and to our tagline that we are IATO. Now, over this 30-year span, we've been able to put in a variety of protocols which include passenger-to-guide ratios, a ship scheduling process that's really robust and first class, Site guidelines. This year alone, we have put together 17 new site guidelines that our operators are going to trial this season. There's an online assessment that crew and staff are required to take, and we also encourage office members to do it, so the home office understands the responsibility. And then other um, environmental things like a mandatory whale slowdown. One of our bigger tools is actually our observation program. Again, something that our members voted on and agreed upon was necessary. Anyone that comes to IATO that wants to join before they're able to become a full member is required to go through this observation program. Then, once every five years, each vessel needs to be observed. And any time a new vessel enters into the fleet, it also needs to be observed. 
Now, as you can imagine, this is quite a bit of work for us. Uh, this last season alone, we had 25 observations occur, and we're on track this season to have just as many. Some of you in the room have actually had the opportunity to serve as an observer for us, and for that, we're grateful. It helps getting your perspective and your involvement in what's going on, and it also challenges us to think about things differently and to work more efficiently. It was interesting, I believe it was yesterday during part of the Camelar discussion, that Megan said, no enforcement means regulations are just a wish. And so at IATO, between our observer program and our peer review process, where we deal with issues that come up that we identify from time to time, we're able to hold each other accountable. Peer pressure amongst our environment and our group tends to be very strong. We don't want to let each other down. We recognize the responsibility that we have, and if one makes an error or mistake, that impacts everyone else. So there's this constant check and balance with the way we execute and do things. There's that reliance on each other. And actually, interestingly, and I don't think a lot of people know this, but within our permit um, application process, there is a component that each operator needs to discuss how they are self-sufficient down there, because we know how remote it is. Part of our self-sufficiency is our reliance on each other, that if someone needs help, we will come and call and respond. Now, we just don't leave this within our own operators. Uh, this actually branches out. We've been of assistance over the years to fishing vessels, national Antarctic programs. Sometimes this is medical, sometimes this is marine related, sometimes it's just logistical with helping provide support. But we are an important asset down there that helps um, strengthen the community overall. It was actually interesting. I appreciated the fact that yesterday Cassandra put up the slide regarding avian influenza. That's another example of how we work with the broader community. Last year, we had the opportunity to see some of the things that was occurring with avian influenza up north. And it was one of the IATO naturalists that came up to IATO and said, we need to do something about this. And that helped spark conversations with Comnap as well as SCAR. And from that, protocols were developed last year that we initially rolled out and have been further strengthened for this upcoming year. For us, we are not just there by ourselves. We are there as part of a broader community. But let's talk about growth. Because I know everyone's looking at these charts going, wow, that's a huge increase. And it is. But I think it bears putting it all into perspective. In 2011, uh, heavy fuel oil was restricted uh, in Antarctica. This combined with the anticipated new polar code that was coming out in 2017 actually caused the operators to pause in terms of some of their growth and some of their ship builds. As a result of that, we saw a large increase in order board coming through in 2018, 19, and through 2020. And that's where you see a lot of the growth reflected, which was that pent up, I would say, process that was occurring because everybody was trying to prepare uh, for these changes that were coming and these requirements and restrictions. We did have an impact though because of COVID. Uh, so a lot of those new ships were actually available and ready to go, but they were held up because of the restrictions that happened with COVID. And then last season, we actually saw that huge increase occur. I think it was shared earlier, we're looking at um, close to 120,000 this upcoming year, so it's still a significant growth. Uh, but the growth there actually has more to do with capacity, where last year capacity wasn't as high as we expected. Uh, and so this year we're expecting a, a bit more capacity. And so the growth will continue. But in the immediate future, what we're seeing is not a lot coming through on the order board. There's not a lot of new ship builds coming through. And so it's not like this is um, kind of like a, a rail running out of tracks, completely out of control. Uh, we anticipate that this will be balanced for a little bit as, as people adjust. The other thing I just want to mention about growth as well, and I think sometimes people miss this, they throw the big number out there, but they don't take a step back and realize what's the makeup on it. Uh, and one of the things that has increased for us is the number of cruise-only passengers. It's that orange component of that graph. And it's about 30% of last year's number, and we're expecting it to be about 30% of this year's. Interesting, one of the components that we had put together, and it's a, 
a measure uh, at the Antarctic Treaty that yet has yet to be fully ratified. But it's the requirement that if a ship has uh, more than 500 passengers, they are not allowed to make a landing. So our crews only passengers are actually just literally just cruising through Antarctica and seeing what's going on. Now where will growth go? That's something that we're keeping an eye out on. Like I said, we're not seeing a lot happening on the order board in the immediate future. Uh, but we do know and we do anticipate that China will enter this market at some point in the future. Interestingly, some of the new vessels that we had come in in the last few years, five of them came from a Chinese uh, shipyard. We also know that that as a market and as guests uh, was increasing pre-COVID. It went from roughly 2,000 in uh, 2012 to over 8,000 by the time we hit right before the pandemic in 1920. So we know with the restrictions lifted last February, we're expecting to see that market continue to grow. And we're responding to that because we realize we need to make sure we have the proper materials to help educate those guests and have them have the same appreciation. People call, quite often say, how much is too much? It's a hard question to answer. Quite frankly, what's amazed me when I look back at IATO and the way they've responded to things over the years and the members have responded, is the members always look at what's going on and they adjust. Uh, in the past, there was a huge focus on landings, landings, landings. In the last few years, we've taken a step back from that and said, what does the Antarctic experience for your guests really mean? Does it have to be a landing? Can there be other activities that you do that allow them to engage with the environment and get that appreciation, but may not put as much pressure on some of the terrestrial landings? So we're talking more these days about the difference between our terrestrial landings and our marine landings, where other activities such as kayak or zodiac cruising are occurring and allowing guests to have that experience. Those experiences can be just as profound. Uh, for any of you that are kayakers, um, I would highly recommend it myself. Uh, there's nothing like being on the water, it being very quiet, and the only thing you're hearing is the crackle of the bergy bits. Um, it's pretty amazing, and it really is surreal in some cases. So hopefully that gives you a little perspective about IATO, who we are, um, and we look forward to continuing our journey. We'll continue to pivot and evolve as new challenges come about, and we appreciate the opportunity to engage with this community because we feel that the more voices involved, the better we are. So thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, Claire, uh, you're up. Thank you. Can you please share with us ASOC's works and talk about the challenges of balancing access to Antarctica with protections for the continent? OK. Uh, Thank you, Becca, and uh, I just wanted to also thank the Wilson Center for hosting this event and for inviting me to speak today. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, so I just wanted to put Antarctica and the human footprint in Antarctica into a little bit of context for this discussion on tourism. Many people think of Antarctica as a pristine location, and that's why they want to go. They want to see the wildlife. They want to see an environment that is largely untouched by a human presence. But the picture is more complicated, and there is a significant human presence in Antarctica. Uh, this on the screen is a, a map of the human footprint in Antarctica. Um, blue and green uh, indicates a, a lower footprint, and yellow, orange, and red uh, indicate higher footprints, with red being the highest. And so you can see, um, this is the Antarctic Peninsula specifically, and I chose that because that's where most of the tourism takes place, and that's where there's also a large concentration of scientific stations. You can see that there are some small areas that have a very, uh, you know, have a lot of orange and red. And um, so there isn't, it, there isn't, a, excuse me, <coughs> there is a significant presence in those areas. And those are also the ice-free areas of the continent. Um, and that is where most human activity takes place. So while if you, if you look at the bigger picture, you might see, say, well, there's actually not a lot of, you know, the, the whole thing isn't red. Um, there is a lot of concentration in the ice-free areas, and that's also where uh, most of Antarctica's biodiversity is. So it is really important to manage activities in these areas if we want to protect Antarctica's biodiversity um, and wilderness for the long term. Um, and this is also a region that is experiencing some of the most rapid warming on the planet, um, almost three degrees Celsius in the past few decades. 
And there's also increasing pressure from krill fishing in the water. So there's a lot of uh, confluence of human activities in this small region. Um, so while we might think, you know, is 100,000 tourists really that much for a whole continent? Is a few thousand scientists really that much for a whole continent? The, those activities are concentrated in a relatively small area, and that's why um, you know, it's important to focus on those activities and manage them appropriately. And when we talk about Antarctica, we often assume that because there's the environment protocol in place that Antarctica is protected. Um, and I've heard people say, oh, that's why we need marine protected areas, because the land is already protected, so we need to protect the ocean as well. Um, and there is the protocol in place, but what the protocol largely did was give Antarctic Treaty parties tools for protection. Um, you know, it wasn't like one and done, uh, where we signed the protocol and now Antarctica is protected forever. Um, it's an on protection is an ongoing process, and what the protocol does brilliantly, in a way, is gave Antarctic Treaty parties tools to manage activities as they change and to be able to respond to environmental changes. You know, as we're seeing climate change, the tools are in the protocol, even though they weren't anticipating climate change at the time. The protocol has tools that are fit for purpose still today to mitigate those effects of climate change. Uh, and unfortunately, um, when it comes to managing the human footprint with those tools uh, from tourism, but also from other scientific activities, uh, Antarctic Treaty parties have not really used those, those tools fully and uh, instead have either opted for kind of a piecemeal approach or just kind of a hands-off approach um, to managing activities. So uh, Annex uh, 5 of the protocol, for example, allows for the creation of protected areas. Um, and these are mostly in line with what we generally think of as um, protected areas anywhere else in the world. Uh, you know, limited activities, maybe even a complete restriction on most activities. In fact, the, the protocol uh, allows for setting aside areas that are completely uh, set, uh, banned activities in which activities are completely banned, um, including scientific scientific activities, and that is because uh, they wanted to preserve the ability of scientists to uh, study them in you know 50 years in the future and see what's happened uh, in the ab complete absence of a human presence. Um, and the but this actually you know isn't just an option. The the protocol actually says that parties are obligated to create. Uh, a systematic uh, network of these protected areas um, to preserve environmental and scientific values. Um, and this is very forward thinking, actually, because you know now we, we talk a lot about 30 by 30 goals, uh, protecting 30% of the land and sea by 2030. Um, but the protocol was uh, written you know, in the 1990s, and people weren't really talking about that then. So it's pretty amazing, actually, that uh, people at the time had kind of the foresight to, to think of some of the things that we, the very tools that we would be using today to protect biodiversity. Um, and also this is an, a, you know, this is an acknowledgement that even with uh, the rest of the protocol, you know, environmental impact assessments, things like that, that there would be needed an, another layer of protection for, for sensitive areas. Um, and in fact, uh, scientists have put in a lot of work to understand Antarctica's biodiversity and the ice-free areas. And they've uh, developed a lot of information uh, about those areas that would enable us to, to protect it. But unfortunately, um, very little of that has been implemented uh, using the protected area provisions uh, in the Antarctic Treaty. Um, today, less than 2% of Antarctica's ice-free areas have been designated as protected areas. And that's uh, well below the target of 30%. And even there were previous targets of 10% uh, for protection. Um, of ecologically important areas, and that's well below that as well. Um, and in fact, let me switch slides. Sorry. Yes. Oh, thank you. Ah, there we go. And in fact, um, if you compare Antarctica to the rest of the world in terms of percentage of area protected, um, green on this map means uh, top uh, quartile, so the most percentage of area protected, and red indicates the smallest. And Antarctica, as you can see, is red. And that is because uh, so little of the land is protected. Um, and you know that is important because, as I mentioned, without the additional layer of protection, um, there isn't really any kind of extra management of those areas. 
um, that we would normally think of as, as being part of managing a national park or managing uh, a protected area. So to bring this back to tourism, um, this year uh, we we saw maybe for the first time that, that I have been attending Antarctic Treaty meetings uh, that many Antarctic Treaty parties were really interested in discussing the development of a comprehensive management system for tourism, of which there really isn't one. Uh, there are very few regulations uh, on tourist activity from the Antarctic Treaty parties. Um, and tourism is always a major topic of discussion, uh, but there's really been very little progress in recent years um, about this. And it seems that the, you know, possibly the, the discussions about growth, possibly other factors as well, have led parties to have maybe a new willingness to actually take action on this, um, or at least take steps towards taking action, which is how it often goes in international meetings. We talk about the steps we want to take um, for a few years, and then we actually take the steps. Um, so I think this is a really important opportunity for Antarctic protection, actually, uh, not only because it's important to manage tourism properly to avoid negative environmental impacts, but because the tourism discussion can be leveraged to push forward uh, bigger picture discussions on scaling up protected areas, for example, um, meeting those 30 by 30 goals for Antarctica, finally. Um, and also an opportunity for the treaty system to take a look um, at the human footprint more generally and how to manage it in a way that is scientifically based and can actually protect biodiversity for the long term. You know, just for example, we, we don't know a whole lot about, um, you know, what are the impacts of, of the human presence? What are the impacts of tourism? Uh, there's, there is some re research in the literature, but it's not always um, providing a consistent um, consistent story about, you know, are penguins disturbed by humans visiting or are they not? Um, some recent research that uh, Heather Lynch and her team have done found that at one popular tourist site during the pandemic, when the tourists weren't there, penguins moved in. And then as soon as the humans came back, uh, the penguins moved out. So, you know, we often do have visit, visited sites with penguins and they're fine. They don't seem to be too disturbed. But Clearly there is an impact um, and there isn't really a comprehensive monitoring system in place where we could detect uh, those kinds of things. We just happen to have that very uh, dramatic uh, natural experiment during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, that's something that the treaty system needs to, to do as well, to honestly be getting more consistent quality information on the impacts of tourism. Um, so protected areas can also help with that because they provide control areas where there is very limited uh, visitation um, and very limited, you know, human infrastructure um, to help us uh, compare those with other areas. Especially in an era of climate change, it can be difficult to figure out what is having an impact on the environment. Is it human activities or is it uh, something bigger? Uh, and finally, the U.S. has the largest number of visitors to the Antarctic and, you know, as an, as a country that's obligated to protect the Antarctic environment. Um, it's really important for the U.S. to, you know, help push these discussions forward and, and help the treaty system look more comprehensively at how it's protecting Antarctic biodiversity and managing activities. Um, and that does mean that there's, like I said, there's going to need to be more, more regulations, more monitoring, um, and more protected areas. You know, we know that the Antarctic environment is going to change a lot regardless of, of what happens. Um, you know, it's not going to look the same 50 years from now. Uh, but we can take steps that can manage and, and allow uh, for more resilience in these ecosystems by limiting um, additional stressors on them. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. And I hope that, I hope if, if uh, the tourism discussion continues at the Antarctic Treaty meetings, that that bigger picture is part of it. Uh, sometimes I think it's easy to get caught up in you know, smaller details like, oh, should people doing, be doing this activity in Antarctica? You know, how many people should land at this specific site? But you really need to look at the bigger picture of the whole continent um, or the whole region um, in the case of the Antarctic Peninsula and figure out what's appropriate, what values do you want to protect, and then, and then look at what activities make sense in that context. So I think that's a big challenge for the Antarctic Treaty uh, system, but it's one that they are need to take and in fact are obligated by signing the protocol to take if they want to get this right and protect this amazing wilderness. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. What an uh, amazing range of issues we have heard from from this panel from um, filmmaking and the, the fishing challenges, the IUU fishing challenges to 
the increase in tourists and also the sort of broader issues about protected areas. So thank you for laying the table for us. Um, I first, uh, before I get into a couple questions that I have teed up, I want to go to our audience because we're very fortunate to have Captain Tom Ritchie with us from Lindblad who has been taking tourists to Antarctica for 40 years and is going to share some, some, <laughs> some thoughts with us about how that works in practice and how it's changed over the years. Tom. Thank you, Becca. I greatly appreciate the presentations and comments by Gina and Claire. Um, I'm, I'm actually a senior expedition leader for Lindblad Expeditions, and I'm sitting with Captain Leif Skog, without question the most experienced Antarctic sea captain alive today. So Becca asked me to talk a little bit about the early history of tourism. Right after the treaty was, was signed, was ratified a few years after that, Lars Erik Lindblad, the Marco Polo of the 20th century, as is often called, managed to charter an old Argentinian military supply vessel called the Lapataya, and he took a group of his friends and fellow adventurers down to Antarctica. 1966, the very first tourist venture to Antarctica. Imagine that. The president of Chile found out about it and was incensed and insisted that following year that Lars Eric use a Chilean vessel, the Navarino, another military supply vessel, a bit of a tub. And he took a second group down there. So this was the second trip to Antarctica. And Lars realized this wasn't sufficient and he managed to get secured the building of a purpose-built ship Lindblad Explorer that was launched in 1969. The U.S. Coast Guard had a, had a problem with this vessel because it was unlike anything else in the world. It had ice capabilities with an ice-hardened hull. It was not a cruise ship, and so they came up with a new designation, Expedition Passenger Vessel. We invented that. And uh, several years later, a few years later, in the middle 70s, I was a graduate student at the University of Florida, grew up in Florida, and Lars hired me to come aboard the Lindblad Explorer as a staff naturalist, lecturer, zodiac driver, et cetera. And that first season, that first austral summer, I was taken down to Antarctica. I was 24 years old, a Florida boy. I'd never seen snow. And I went to Antarctica for the first time. I was a little intimidated, but it, came, it got into my blood. And I've been to Antarctica almost every season since then. So. Imagine averaging four to five trips a year. How many trips to Antarctica have, have I made? Along with Leif, I mean, my God, you know, hundreds. And uh, I found myself working with Roger Torrey Peterson, the Field Guide series founder, um, Sir Peter Scott, son of Robert Falcon Scott, who founded the World Wildlife uh, Fund, um, Keith Shackleton, the grandnephew of Ernest Shackleton, Dennis Pulston, the founder of Environmental Defense Fund, Bernard Stonehouse, uh, Wally Herbert, you know, these giants in our, uh, polar exploration, scientists, ecologists, environmentalists, conservationists, and that's what we we're all about. We we're all about education as well as giving an experience. And I've, had, I've heard many panelists complain about the lack of awareness of the issues with Antarctica. Well, that's what tourism is all about, educating people, increasing the awareness of it, of it all. Not everybody is satisfied with seeing a nature documentary on TV. I've actually met David Attenborough. He was on board our ship, um, not in Antarctica, but you know, he's one of the great presenters of uh, Antarctic ecology and awareness. But we had it all to ourselves. In those early days, there was one little company, Lindblad Travel, that had one little ship, Lindblad Explorer, and we went all over the world, from the high Arctic to Antarctica, to the Amazon River, New Guinea, every, everywhere you could imagine. But every austral summer, we were down in Antarctica. And after several years, a second company started emulate, emulating what we were doing. And then a third and a fourth, and by 1990, there were six or seven companies offering ship-based uh, ship tours to Antarctica. And we felt, because we were such an environmentally sound operation, that's what we were all about, we wanted to make sure everybody was in, a, in a agreement with us because there's no government agency overseeing 
tourism in Antarctica. So we proposed to our, the other operators down there, let's get together and govern ourselves. We'll be a self-governing body because no, there's nothing else governing tourism. And we came up with the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators. I was the Lindblad person and helped establish the bylaws and regulations and like, and it came out, it was established in 1991, the same year the protocol of environmental protection came out. We came out together at the same time. A few years later, the consultative parties of the Antarctic Treaty Organization adopted our bylaws into um, recommendation 18-1, guidance to visitors of visitors to the Antarctic. That was IATO, essentially IATO bylaws and regulations and everything. So it has worked very well so far and I, I really appreciated Gina's comments so I don't have to go into what IATO is all about. And we also have with us one of, we, we've always promoted science and supported science. Many of our lecturers through time have been National Science Foundation personnel um, being paid, working for us, actually, as lecturers and the like. And we have, we have transported personnel, materiel. Throughout the years, we have scientific um, projects going on board our vessels. You know, that first little ship, she was a tub. She floated like a cork. Uh, I lived on her for 10 years. I loved her. We would set off from, well, not Ushuaia because there was no airport then. We went from Punta Arenas in uh, Magellan Strait. We get to the end of the Beagle Channel and turn right. And we had no idea what we were in, sto in store for. We'd get our butts kicked a lot in that little, little ship that rolled like a cork. Um, but nowadays, our ships are much better, much more suited to exploration, stronger ice class, better weather predicting capabilities. I mean, it's incredibly safer and more comfortable and better, and it's amazing to me to hear so often, wow, this was a trip of a lifetime. I've dreamed all my life of going to Antarctica. I saved up for years, or what have you. And I've even heard panelists talking about, you know, an incredible adventure, this trip to Antarctica. And I was surprised last night at, the, at, a, at a reception that Leif and I were at to learn that some of our panelists have never been to Antarctica. Guilty oh my gosh. Started. Come with us. <laughs> Come as a lecturer or, or something. I'll take uh, we'll, we'll try to get you down there. Thank you. Um, Lisa Kelly, I didn't see her this morning. She was here yesterday. Oh, there, there you are, yes. Lisa Kelly was one of our staff members. I'd like to say I trained her, but uh, anyway, she became one of our expedition leaders and then later became manager station manager of Palmer Base on Anvers Island in the Antarctic Peninsula, and now she's director of operations of IALO. So, you know, I've had a long association with Antarctic tourism, and it's not about to stop, and I appreciate being able to just say something. That, about the early days of Antarctica. Those were terrific remarks. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I appreciate those sea stories. That's, I think you and the, the Coast Guard captains from the opening panel might have to go have some conversation about uh, comparing sea stories. Um, it's, it's so clear. I guess I've, I have two remarks that I'm going to throw out for, a f uh, for you all to comment on before we wrap up. It's so clear that there's this intimate relationship between conservation and um, stewardship in Antarctica. And we hear that from Tom's stories about the titans of conservation who were present for these sort of early expeditions there. Um, and I think it's impossible to pull those two apart, but I'm wondering if any of the panelists have any comments about um, sort of the ways in which tourism is shifting. That's a remarkable increase in numbers, and obviously not everyone who goes on an expedition to Antarctica now is founding the Environmental Defense Fund, right? So what do we think about sort of how tourism is changing and what that means for what we have done in the past? Is it still good enough going to the f into the future? And then I want to connect this to sort of the broader narrative I think we've heard about over the last couple of days. Is the Antarctic Treaty system able to withstand the current geopolitical situation um, and the changing dynamics around the globe that are putting pressure on the U.S. and its allies with regard to sort of the erosion of, of U.S. global supremacy and the rise of a more multipolar system. 
That sounds very far away from tourism, but when we think about the ways in which tourism is shifting and the rise of China as an increasingly significant player in global tourism, is the system for managing tourism in Antarctica similarly you know, under threat from this sh shifting concept, context? And is it going to be able to withstand the coming changes? So I wonder if, if the panel could comment on that and, and how the changes in sort of the tourism and media landscape impact their own work. I might start in reverse order, so Claire, Gina, and then Peter wrapping us up. Thank you. Uh, sure. Well, I think there really isn't a system for managing tourism, and that's the problem. Um, is It's really the Antarctic Treaty Party's responsibility to, to put that into place. Um, and they really have not wanted to do that uh, for various reasons. I think they think it's very difficult, uh, time consuming. It's hard for everybody to agree, um, even on some small issues uh, that it seems like they should be able to agree on, like nobody can build a hotel in Antarctica. Well, then you get a discussion on um, what constitutes a hotel, because some scientific stations uh, do host paid uh, visitors, um, and they fund their scientific activities with that. Um, so while I think on the surface there's a general agreement that we want tourism to stay low impact um, and, you know, we don't want, you know, souvenir shops at every <laughs> visitor site or Starbucks or something like that, um, in practice it's very hard to get those 20-something countries to agree, you know, by consensus to put something legally binding in place. And, um, you know, like, uh, like Gina was saying, you know, IATO is a trade association, they're not a legal governing body, and it's really not their responsibility. Um, you know, they manage themselves, but it's not their responsibility to set the the rules by which um, operators operate. So I think that is a big challenge because we are having so much trouble reaching consensus on things in the Antarctic Treaty system that used to be very routine. Um, and I think that so I think the the prospect of putting in place some kind of comprehensive management system for tourism um, is is long overdue and it's needed, but I think getting those details and getting everybody to agree on what that looks like is going to be a huge challenge. Uh, but it's a necessary one. I mean, there's really no point in having the Antarctic uh, Treaty or the protocol if it doesn't actually affect how people, you know, act in Antarctica and what they do. Um, and especially now, you know, in this era of, uh, you know, we've got this global biodiversity framework, you know, 30 by 30, things like that, people are really looking at what is most effective in protecting biodiversity and, and wilderness values in the long term. And, um, you know, it takes comprehensive management. It, it takes people, you know, making decisions about where you can and can't go and what you can and can't do. And unfortunately, there really isn't a lot of decision making about that right now, at least not in a very holistic way. Um, even though all these countries know how to do that. They know how to do systematic conservation planning um, for natural or wilderness areas. Um, it's just very difficult to get them all to agree on one way to do it. So I think it is going to be a huge challenge. Um, you know, it may, again, 100,000 tourists for a whole continent may not seem like a lot to the outside world, but it is really important to get it right um, for the long-term benefit of the Antarctic environment. And it really is this is a key response. I think this is a key responsibility of these countries, and unfortunately, they haven't done it so far. But I hope, hopefully, they will. They are now waking up to that, and will do it in the future. So, thank you. And and as the ATCM is locked up, IATO is, you know, for the interim at least, certainly going to be the sort of guiding structure, providing some kind of system. For, you know, in the in the absence of formal ATCM management system, this is what we have so far. So, you know, Gina, can you offer some comments? Yeah, and I actually want to hit upon uh, both sides of the question that you asked or you put forward, one around stewardship, uh, because as I said before, we're constantly evolving and pivoting as things change within our community. And so this past year, uh, we actually at our annual meeting voted through uh, a new strategic plan, and it, the theme of it is around stewardship. So it was actually nice to hear you use that word, uh, because We've done a tremendous amount of support over the years down in Antarctica, uh, but as we're growing, we're realizing there's more power behind the things that we're seeing and what we're knowing and how we're helping. So we're going to look to kind of harness that and understand that better to, one, educate people, um, but also to hopefully start to identifying where some of the gaps are and where we may want to make future investments in scientific research to help answer some of the other questions that are out there. Uh, this past year, a perfect example is we put through a voluntary uh, 
whale and pinniped observation program, siding pro program, and from that we were able to make decisions at this year's annual meeting to add some more geofenced areas regarding where we do our whale slowdowns. The intern that we had working with us, uh, which was actually someone that was uh, advised under Heather, uh, one of the things we had her do was look in, at the science that's out there in general and compare what we're seeing to the science. One of the interesting things she hit upon, and it was hit upon yesterday in relation to the availability of science, is in some situations the science isn't actually being published until four to five years later. We're in an environment that is changing rapidly. And so if we're not able to respond to something sooner, that puts us on the back foot. And we don't want to be on the back foot. We want to be proactive. We want to be helping the environment. So for us, that stewardship is part of that, and we're going to be developing more monitoring programs and engaging our field staff more to share what they're seeing. I wish I could take Tom's brain and kind of crack it open and tap out all the things that he's noticed over the last 46 years, um, because there's unquestionably a ton of knowledge that we haven't captured in the past, and we need to start doing a better job of that. The other aspect of that is the fact that we are bringing so many people down there and there is an inherent responsibility that we have to make ambassadors out of everyone that goes down there. If our guests are not having an impactful change in their thoughts and in their actions when they get home, we have missed an opportunity. And so we're formalizing our Antarctic ambassador program to specifically address this. That all goes back to stewardship because that is a responsibility we feel that we have. As it relates to ATCM, you know, um, Claire hit upon a lot of the challenges. Quite frankly, uh, we talk to the party members regularly about the things that we need, uh, the things that help, would help us as it relates to what goes on in Antarctica. Uh, the first, I, I hit upon one of them before, there are some measures that haven't been ratified by individual countries yet. For us, it's really important that that happens. Uh, one of them I hit upon before is Measure 15 from 2009 regarding landing of passengers. And another is Measure 4 from 2004 around liability and contingency planning. I know this was something that was very close to Evan. Uh, and in the US, we've missed the opportunity there to move that forward. It'd be really nice to be able to see things like that move forward. From an IATO standpoint, we hold our members accountable to it. So even though it hasn't been put through yet, our members are held accountable to those measures, even if a country hasn't ratified it. But on top of that, not everyone is a member of IATO. And we have noticed bad actors down there over the years. And so what we really need are the treaty parties to, you know, put a little bit more enforcement in that, take action against those bad actors, because it makes it very hard for our members to go down there and see that, and see how some people may be treating the wildlife. It's very disheartening and it can be very frustrating. And the last thing, or there's two more things, is because, and I think Claire hit upon the differences between the different countries, there's also a different process as it relates to permits and authorizations. For us, that discrepancy between how countries handle it causes a problem from time to time regarding what someone may try to do with one country versus another. So we need to see alignment there. And then finally, the one thing that we always ask for, and we've been very blessed because they have actively engaged us over the years, we are an invited expert to the treaty party members and we are able to share information, but to continue to engage us in those conversations. Our members are down there, they're seeing what's going on, we see firsthand and we have some great perspective. And so as we continue those conversations, and I know Heather, or, I'm sorry, Claire hit upon the hotels, we're not for that. Uh, we are not for the permanent infrastructure, so we're aligned with that, but engaging us with those conversations will continue to be helpful as we move forward because it's all about also bringing the community into it and having people take pride in moving forward. So great, quick perspectives. Thank you, Gina. Peter, you're a storyteller. I'm gonna ask you to close us out. We are over time now, real quick. How do you, oh, I, I, have, I have a question, I'm sorry. How do we tell stories for a broader audience, right? You know, I think you've been so effective already in your work. How do you communicate about Antarctica to a bigger picture, to a global audience? On a human level, you know, character is, um, I think, the number one thing in, in all my stories. I always look for characters and, um, that's who people identify with. Those characters can be animals or humans or both. But I think um, 
yeah, to get people, it, it gives, it builds empathy. Um, the thing about the Rossi um, and our documentary is that we needed people to care for this place, which, as I said, none of them will ever get to really. And um, you can you can do that. That's the power of film, and it's one of the um, great pleasures of bringing those stories together. Uh, I'd just like to round off to the tourism. I, I'm not hugely experienced, but as I said, I've, I've been down to the peninsula on a tourist vessel and into the Ross Sea. And I've got to say my experience on those boats, I, I was super impressed with the way that um, they adhered to the rules and what we were and weren't allowed to do. Um, I do am concerned when I see the big liners going down there, but um, I just think everything that happens in Antarctica is going to have an impact. I mean, it's not just tourism, it's the bases, it's a science, and we just need to realise that every bit of footprint creates an impact. And um, I, I think there's, we're doing great things in terms of um, protecting that area and setting up those rules and regulations. But um, yeah, I'm not too sure if that rounded it off, but that's, that's, that was terrific. that's my final remark. Thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you to this wonderful, diverse panel for these really interesting perspectives on this issue. Um, we will now take a 15-minute coffee break. Thank you all. Let's give them a warm round. Coffee break, so I, I, they might be sitting by their screens waiting for us. <laughs> To get back, so I think we'll we'll get going again, and I am um, honored to introduce our next panel here, which will be a fireside chat with two senior leaders who will talk about key missions and capabilities that enable the U.S. presence in Antarctica. Major General Denise Donnell is commander of the New York Air National Guard and a naval aviator who has commanded at the squadron group and wing level. She served as commander of the 13th Air Expeditionary Group at McMurdo Station, Antarctica, and will be speaking to us about the remarkable mission of flying into Antarctica. Mr. Mike Emerson is a retired Coast Guard aviator who is now a member of the Senior Executive Service and serves as Director for Maritime Transportation Systems for the U.S. Coast Guard. He will be speaking to us about the Antarctic icebreaking mission. The conversation will be led and moderated by Dr. Mike Sfrega, Chair and Distinguished Fellow at the Wilson Center. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Can everybody hear us? Yes, okay, thanks. Uh, well, I think this, this panel is perfectly situated now from what we've heard this morning. Uh, increased attention to the continent, increased demands on the continent, the, the sense of urgency around some areas, like making sure we have the right rules, regulations, policies, infrastructure. Uh, public knowledge of the continent and what's happening there. Uh, I think the two presenters here today will provide for us real insight into the capabilities and the way in which at least the U.S. interests in the continent are being supported, enabled, and maybe peek over the horizon as we see demand signal from so many different areas coming, whether it's the research community, the tourism, uh, you can't avoid the geopolitics now uh, around the region. Uh, so this will be a wonderful way to further understand what capabilities, assets uh, are, in, are in the Antarctic in support of our nation's um, national interests there across the board. Uh, maybe we will do some comparisons as to what other nations might, might have there and with the demands that that puts on both of you. But Mike, may maybe I'll ask you to start the presentation. Uh, brief presentation, several minutes, and then we'll uh, then go to, to the general and then we'll, we'll engage in the discussion as well. Mike. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's uh, pretty uh, convenient to talk about icebreakers on uh, National Icebreaker Day. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. I didn't get a card. <laughs> Becca, the, um, let me open with a story first because I was a tourist and that last panel really spoke to me. I'd like you to identify with me. I went out to uh, a blue glacier the most uh, incredible experience to land in a helicopter, which I'm a fixed wing aviator, land on a helicopter and pick up a piece of blue ice, which I took back. And uh, when we got to the uh, McMurdo station, I pulled this out and of course it didn't thaw or, or melt or anything. Uh, so it was very convenient to have that, break it in half and split it with a friend of mine who brought that tribute, that bottle of tribute uh, scotch called Shackleton. 
Um, it didn't do much for the scotch, but uh, it was a novelty to have blue ice uh, that the glaciologist said, Mike, you know, that's 35,000 year old ice. So it, it tastes a good, and, and it might have been the neutrinos. Yeah. I will, I don't know, what it, you guys made that up, right? Neutrino's not real. Um, I'm going to start by saying that, uh, like I'm photons, not sure where any of this is going to go, so photons. just I was waiting for the disclaimer. folks online to Yeah, because way slides. to pick up the morning. The challenges to uh, rules-based order, in my opinion, may well begin in the maritime environment. Uh, we just talked about tourism. We've talked about uh, fishing and IUU fishing in particular, uh, and even uh, references to marine uh, protected areas. Uh, a lot of opportunity there for things to increase, increase tourism. We saw the chart. I read it a little different than you, uh, Gina, but, but I, uh, nonetheless, managed or not, um, we think tourism's probably going to increase. Maybe other countries will get more active in it. Uh, there are opportunities um, in fishy, fishing, uh, we've seen migration activities up in the north uh, latitudes, up in the North Pole. We may see changes in the fishing activity and behavior in the South Pole and uh, may attract more fishing. Um, we have to be prepared for the, the risk associated with those. And in particular, uh, one of the signals that you get from the Arctic was recently a uh, recent announcement by Russian President Putin who just approved the use of conventional tankers for exporting oil through the northern sea route. Uh, why would we care? Uh, obviously, like the Antarctic, uh, the South Sea, uh, we would like to keep uh, both the South Sea and Arctic pristine, and we don't need uh, traditional thin-skinned vessels toting big bellies full of oil uh, through the water. Um, something to take a look at. The, uh, the polar code's been thrown out the window effectively. I know that there's some desperation on the Russian side and the sanctions have been applied and, and maybe that's uh, self-fulfilling, but it's not time to discard the rule book, certainly not in Antarctica. The risks are pretty significant. Um, I showed you a, a picture here to start the uh, conversation of the Coast Guard's involvement in Antarctica and obviously the Polar Star is, is the uh, foundation. Uh, it's the mainstay. This is uh, Polar Star muscling the uh, ice pier that was uh, mentioned by Keith Rapella, muscling that around, getting it into position. Um, the Coast Guard takes this mission very seriously in our support role to NSF, in our partnership with the Air National Guard, and we are significantly invested. As Keith mentioned to you, uh, Captain Rapella, um, he, he said they're single mission. I'll take exception to that, but they are a focused uh, single intent of fulfilling our responsibilities uh, to the Antarctic program. And, and what I mean by that is we take that ship out of dry dock, send it right down to Antarctica. It does its mission for four or five, increasing uh, uh, durations uh, in, as the season is extending a little bit. We're going into uh, late February and early March now before winter comes in. Uh, we're keeping that, that uh, icebreaker down there and um, as soon as it's finished, it comes right back to the dry dock. We're coordinating uh, service life extension level maintenance. This is huge investments of time, of contractors, adjustments of schedules to accommodate NSF's mission and then get, get this ship ready to do it again uh, eight months later. Um, big investments. Coast Guard brings the support role uh, and, and we, we do it seriously. Um, we've got some unique authorities. Uh, first of all, we have a mandate for icebreaking. We assume this from the Navy in the late 60s, and we are the national icebreaking capability. We have two. Um, our unique authorities uh, would be to break out McMurdo as well as Thule Station in Greenland, uh, which we get help from the Canadians. Uh, but we also have a unique military law enforcement uh, blend of, of authorities and responsibilities. And those are supported not only in statute, but by bilateral, multilateral agreements with Aussies, with, with uh, the UK, with other partners uh, throughout the, the world. Um, and I think that those are only going to proliferate into further responsibilities. So about the maritime missions, uh, I, I said we're not single mission, we're multi-mission. Um, 
And, and I could give you some examples, the McMurdo breakout and, and the escorts re required uh, that were previously mentioned. Uh, those are obviously the focal point. We have gotten back into treaty support, uh, doing sea-based uh, support, providing uh, a base for uh, boarding teams to go and make surprise inspections. And I suspect the demand signal for that will grow, particularly as we uh, introduce the new, more capable polar security cutters. Uh, marine safety, I mentioned the, the fishing and the, the tourism and the cruise ships. There's a lot of examples, but our search and rescue capabilities uh, are often tested in, uh, across the globe, uh, much less in the South Sea. Um, uh, Dr. Faulkner used to accuse us of, of having ADD and not being able to focus because she wanted her breakout, but we love a good star case. Uh, we do refueling, as was mentioned at Marble Point, uh, support to some of the foreign research stations. Uh, we do like uh, the Aussies in New Zealand and some of the other uh, countries that uh, support us, the Chileans, and uh, I can't miss the Chileans. Thank you for the uh, uh, support last night. Uh, we have environmental response uh, requirements, and I see those increasing, sub subject to uh, uh, further discussion. We've done bathmetric uh, surveys and collected data in the coastal regions, a lot of coastal surveys, because, hey, we're out there. Um, mooring deployments, research projects like penguin and seal surveys, remote uh, weather data collections, and, and uh, even providing uh, access to glaciers. These are some of the things that um, uh, periodically are added on as, as uh, support, um, uh, support to those missions or, or primary uh, tasking. Uh, so too, monitoring fishing uh, as we do in other areas, perhaps uh, whaling. And uh, again, uh, I go back to IUU. This case was already mentioned, but it's a, uh, a good reminder. Um, Captain Boda really described his impressions of, of how significant uh, he would be remembered in history. Um, I forget what he said, but it seemed important. But with, with new activities, you're going to get a lot of new risk. And uh, with the, uh, the tourism and, and fishing mentioned uh, previously, um, even perhaps more shipping. As the uh, ice recedes and the uh, climate changes, we're seeing up in the Arctic increases in shipping. Uh, would there be resource development? I don't know. Maybe it's taboo to say. But I do think that we're going to build a pretty good case here today uh, for having more U.S. presence. More presence means more influence. And that is my only motivation. Whether you like tourism or you don't like tourism or you're not a friend of the earth, uh, you have to accept that the U.S. leadership is significant if you want to have forward progress with the uh, Antarctic Treaty and be able to uh, have more accountability. Uh, let me be uh, uh, quick about doing this. The Antarctic Chieftain case uh, is a great example in uh, February of uh, 2015 uh, that was mentioned here. It's a, a great example of, of the challenges of, of severe weather, of low temperatures, of the remoteness and uh, even insufficient comms, lousy infrastructure, uh, limited nav aids. There's all sorts of, of dangers in Antarctic waters uh, that we do want to be mindful of with IATO or with any type of uh, coordinated management of tourism and the other uh, areas. But Motor Vessel Explorer, you've all Googled that, that uh, red cruise ship that was carrying, uh, what was it, uh, 200 folks or so that sunk in 2007. Very famous picture, the Clelia uh, II was another one in distress, 160 packs back in November of 2010. Um, that one ran aground, then uh, shut down one of the uh, shafts and, and had to limp through some foul weather and was really in danger of not making it. Uh, more recently, the uh, Viking Polaris hasn't been mentioned yet, but uh, they got some window damage. You might have seen that one uh, last year. Killed one person, 10 injured. Uh, hit by a rogue wave. Join me here. There's no such thing as a rogue wave uh, in the South Ocean. If you've seen it, you know that. Ocean Explorer, don't name your ship Explorer. I, uh, I warn you. Um, the Ocean Explorer grounded in uh, Northwest Greenland uh, just earlier this month on uh, September 12th, 206 passengers. The, uh, the great quote from the Danish Joint Arctic Command was, luckily it was calm, um, which is a good thing because they, they grounded on the 4th 
and they just went into some mud. That's not a big deal. That's a Monday, but uh, the, the first sign of help came on Friday. That's four days later, 206 people. If you run out of power, your generator shut down, it might get cold. Um, you have to look at some of those risks. And even more recently, the Polar Front, I think is the name. I just heard this one uh, yesterday. Uh, Southeast Greenland um, lost power, had a mechanical failure. And they're, again, in a, uh, in a remote environment with limited response resources. Uh, you're going to call the Coast Guard. The uh, expense and logistics of, of long-range rescues, we're already familiar with doing that uh, up in uh, other challenging areas up in the Arctic and, and the like. Uh, very, uh, very concerning for me. Um, other things, ships colliding with mammals, we see examples of that around uh, even just in the northeast off of Canada. Uh, certainly can be an issue, impacts to uh, marine activity. Uh, pollution is obviously a, a, a threat and, of course, the importation of disease. Uh, we've all learned about COVID and bird flu and, and the, the uh, perils of, of ballast water. So uh, your Coast Guard is, is here to, uh, to bring its unique authorities and, and to get us uh, more confidence in the zone of peace. Uh, it is a peaceful, it's a beautiful environment. Shackleton was wrong. Uh, it's not a, an awful place. Um, or was that Scott? Uh, I'm not a historian or a scientist. Um, I thought neutrinos was a Seinfeld thing. But we, uh, we, we got here by science and, and, uh, and even security. We need to continue those. And we need to talk safety and stewardship in the same sentence. Stewardship is such a, a lousy word. But uh, accountability. We have to. We have to have some some ownership of uh, how we manage things. You can't just uh, offer the rules. You have to enforce them. And and I think we're going to have a, a little bit uh, more discussion there. You can't talk about Antarctica without talking about climate change. We've talked about receding ice and um, and you know well, I heard Bergy bits today. So you do know that the calving that Ken Boda talked about uh, leads to icebergs, and, and those can be perilous. With uh, receding ice and more open water, you get more extreme weather. You get more unpredictable weather, and some of you know this much better than me, but we, uh, we see it all the time, and it's, it's when you con combine that with uh, distances and, and limited uh, areas for refuge, there's no place to run and hide. You can get uh, yourself in a uh, sea state of uh, 10 foot waves and, and 20 knots, you can, in the turn of a dime, you can, you can be in 40 foot waves and, and have 70 knot winds, was one of the stories I was told uh, earlier, uh, and, and no place to go. We want to keep it like this. We want it to stay peaceable, and, um, and I hope that we can do it. And my solution would be to uh, uh, introduce you to our, our polar security cutter in some detail. The uh, multi-mission nature of this vessel is going to allow it to bring all of those uh, uh, minor missions uh, in one vessel, as, as Captain Boda said, uh, a very capable vessel that could operate in both polar and tropical and temperate climates uh, to bring presence, to bring influence, and to enforce sovereignty, to, um, to be connected, to have the ability to... Um, uh, not just have communications, but have access to information that's, that's being gathered by us, by our allies, by scientists, by anyone, to be able to uh, harness that and have the domain awareness in one location where we can make decisions, uh, data-driven decisions on the maritime domain and, and be able to position ourselves for enforcement, for compliance efforts to keep the treaty and and the uh, different um, programs that we put in place for management uh, to keep those viable. Um, what I would uh, tell you is we are not replacing the Polar Star. We are not just uh, taking uh, the old battering ram and, and putting another one out there. This is going to be a lot smarter technology. It's a very complex vessel, um, but it's going to give us the capability to still break the big ice. Uh, Polar Star can break uh, ridge ice up to 24 feet. That's two stories high. That is big ice. That's, there's only a couple of nuclear icebreakers that can, can break that kind of ice. And, um, and you want her on your team. We, we just have the one. Healy, uh, very commendable uh, 
uh, shortstop, but uh, we we need the uh, we need the the big uh, heavy to uh, get us. Uh, in the game once Polar Star retires. Uh, we will have Arctic security cutters to follow. Um, I think we're going to look at uh, these cutters in uh, Klaus's terms in terms of dual use. Uh, they're going to be focused on all the things that keep the Antarctic pure and, and peaceable and, and um, pristine in terms of uh, you know, properly managing the fisheries and the, and the, uh, the waterway users for tourism, and et cetera. Uh, but we also want to have the enforcement side, the, uh, the side that looks at uh, the behavior that uh, members of the treaty and, and others uh, uh, produce and, and is able to have influence on those. And that's what you get with a, an armed service sponsored uh, ice breaking capability. Um, enforcing laws and MPAs, I see a lot of growth potential there, and there are laws that, uh, regulations that haven't been written that, that need to, uh, to be further defined, but this is going to be a vessel that can do it. It's going to support the, uh, the inspections to a greater degree than ever, certainly having a flight deck uh, that operates and, and helicopter capabilities will give us more uh, reach and surprise, and then uh, it's going to be capable of select uh, research. Not, uh, not doing um, detailed science projects and, and laboratory uh, functions, but doing those, uh, the kind that I mentioned previously, where you've got the range, you've got the legs and, and the power and the, and the modular capability to, to uh, roll on and roll off uh, different apparatus to be able to uh, leverage cranes and what have you and bring the right uh, teams, the right expertise. So this is a, uh, this is a very complicated uh, acquisition. It's admittedly taken a while. Uh, it's long overdue. I'll admit you uh, all of those, but I think that there's a great applicability in the future. I think we're going to have to look at uh, investments in uh, follow-on investments in infrastructure, which will work out with our partners and with uh, NSF and the lead federal agencies. Uh, as they come, we'll, uh, we'll have to look at port facilities. We'll have to look at... Um, expanding the polar code, uh, applying the standards for ship designs and constructions to all vessels that operate in these intense areas. And second, um, you know, governing the behavior, uh, getting some accountability for uh, the risk that we take and the decisions that we make when we go out and operate uh, uh, almost independently out there, and perhaps we shouldn't. Um, the investment in the polar security cutter that, that you see here, is uh, only going to improve our partnership. We're partnered with uh, the Air National Guard to provide access to Antarctica, to McMurdo and the South Station, and to support those facilities. And uh, we have a great partnership with, uh, with NSA and, and hopefully with all of you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mike. General, he, he, did the, he did the segue, so I'm just gonna turn it right over to you. All right, Perfect. so uh, my key takeaway is that uh, Airplanes are safer than boats. Is that, is that good? <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah, so I'm here in uniform, and I'm a general officer, and I've got a great team of lawyers behind me. So I have a, a public announcement. Uh, the views I express today are my own, and I do not represent the Department of Defense uh, with those views. So please uh, take it that for what it's worth, because uh, what you hear from the Air Force may not be what you hear from me today. So if you have ever been to McMurdo via an airplane or uh, to the South Pole for that matter, you have probably flown on a C-17, flown by the United States Air Force, or you have flown on a LC-130, which you can see behind me right now. So the uh, C-17s and the LC-130, very complicated, not quite as complicated as a uh, polar security cutter, but uh, we're pretty proud of them. I've had a chance to fly both. So uh, I will tell you right now that airlift along with sea lift is the key to supporting the National Science Foundation and all the research efforts that we've talked about over the last day. To, that is not an understatement, I do not believe. Again, these are my opinions. Uh, but what you have when you bring cargo in via ship, a very complicated system of naval personnel, nav chaps, the hardest working folks in the business, take it off the cargo ships, after the icebreakers have broken the way through. They bring it into McMurdo, and then from there, a complicated uh, 
system of airlift takes it out to the fields. So if you think the South Pole exists in a vacuum without food or fuel or scientific equipment, I am here to tell you that there are LC-130Hs that were once flown by the Navy 35 years ago that are doing that, not quite as we speak, but next month. So we talk about five months for a Coast Guard vessel to get down. It takes about five days for an LC-130 to get to Antarctica. And from there, we spend the next four months during the Austral summer to support the National Science Foundation and their efforts. So I'll like have a, apparently I have the power. So I'll go to the next one. The power is limited. How does this work? I think limitedly. It works limitedly. Ah, oh, okay. There you go. Apparently, if you hit the right button, it's uh, it's more effective. So. Uh, Operation Deep Freeze. We've touched about on Operation High Jump earlier with Dr. Brooks. Operation Deep Freeze is the follow-on to that. Uh, roughly 1955 or so, the Navy took over uh, to help the efforts for logistics in Antarctica. And then uh, 1988, they saw a willing partner in the New York Air National Guard. We were flying the uh, distant early warning line in Greenland, so we had experience with ski operations, and we were very happy to come and help them out. We were a little puzzled by the Navy culture, but uh, once we figured that out and put our own footprint on it, uh, things became a lot better, uh, particularly in 1998 when the 109th took over the mission and those airframes from the Navy. So we're talking about planes that are in the harshest environment you can imagine, which you're all probably very well aware. And they're anywhere from 27 to almost 50 years old. And what does that mean for you? Well, that means within about 15 years, uh, according to the engineers, you will start to see restrictions on the first two of these aircraft. And what does restrictions mean? Well, the restrictions are based on the center wing box. And uh, I could go into great detail, but I'm an international politics major and a pilot. I'm not an aeronautical engineer. Uh, but that uh, would result in catastrophic mission failure if uh, we had a center wing box failure. So we're very attentive to this. And you might say, hey, 15 years, that's an enormous amount of time. It's not. The acquisitions process is extremely complicated. I think it's been, what, roughly 40 years for a new icebreaker? Uh, we, we estimate it will take uh, at least 10 years to recapitalize a fleet of only 10 airplanes. And that's, uh, that's one of my key takeaways. This is a very, very small fleet of only 10 airplanes with an average age of uh, closer to 50 years than 25. That is a uh, significant thing, and I... Uh, have heard our National Science Foundation friends who could not be here today, uh, and, but they, they've told me I can say this without telling who, it, who said it. Uh, they consider the LC-130 to be the most critical element of their logistics change, chain on the, on the Antarctic continent and the most at risk. So within 15 years, you may not have C-130s able to support the South Pole Station. Yep, there are uh, Bassler's and there are Twin Otters. Those are extremely tiny airplanes. They carry a few passengers, maybe hundreds of pounds of cargo. An LC-130 carries th easily 30 or 40 passengers and thousands of pounds of cargo. The ice core samples, which we haven't touched on too much, but those are pretty awesome. I'm sure they make for a great drink, <laughs> if you're allowed to do that. Um, they come back on the LC-130s. That's how those type of uh, scientific efforts come back to be evaluated and, and processed and, and gone in, into the academia world where it takes three to four years, apparently, to, to publish something. But uh, at least there is something to work on. We haven't, oops, there we go. I can learn. We have not been static. We don't, uh, in the Air National Guard, we do not uh, stop and, and admire a problem. We try to figure things out. So what we have done at the 109th Airlift Wing is we have worked to put new props on these airplanes. We started out with, uh, with one about 15 years ago. It's called an MP2000. It uh, looks like scimitars to me, at least. It's an eight 
inflated prop. All of our planes now have these props. And what that helps us with is additional thrust to get, uh, get off the snow uh, when you're in the deep field camps, which uh, is enormously helpful to get the nose off the ice and, uh, and ability to get off the ground. We're also working on new engines, a 3.5 engine. Uh, that's, uh, that's a work in progress. We also have some avionics upgrades that we're working on. But the most important thing, uh, from my perspective as the commander of the New York Air National Guard, is we're working to replace these airplanes. We call it something clunky called recapitalization. And it takes, we think, at least 10 years. And it will take a lot of money. And uh, if you remember what I said for managing expectations at the beginning, I speak for myself, not the United States Air Force. Um, this is not the highest priority for the Department of Defense. We're not an F-35. We're not a fighter. We're not even a C-17 or a refueler. We're polar tactical airlift in a, in a world where that uh, is not always seen as the most important component of a fleet. So what uh, I hope you take away from my talk today uh, other than the fact that the South Pole Station is an absolutely amazing place that I've had a chance to visit and walk around. I've uh, apparently never been uh, quite uh, cool enough to get inside. I'm sure Mike has been inside. Haven't you? Yes, you have. So I'm uh, insanely jealous because it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, every single thing you see in this picture, well, mostly, was brought in by an LC-130. So in order to build the South Pole Station, it was all brought in via LC-130. We bring in the fuel, we bring in the food, all the other stores that are necessary to sustain that population over the winter, that's what we do. C-17s do an airdrop during the winter, but I'm here to talk about LC-130s today. <laughs> so why is that important? We talk about access, awareness, security, all those good things. If we can't sustain the South Pole Station, it's my opinion that somebody else will. And I'll let our policy friends think about who that might be. I have a <laughs> couple of ideas uh, of folks that might be interested in having that footprint. So what do I hope are your key takeaways here today? Um, one is that airmen can take some pretty cool pictures. So Peter, uh, you're on notice that uh, we have some folks that can, uh, can rival you almost. But, uh, but uh, other than that, I want you to understand that um, the LC-130, along with our partners in the Coast Guard, uh, the Navy, and uh, believe it or not, the Army does go to Antarctica uh, to do certain, uh, certain tasks. We are the backbone of logistics in Antarctica. Certainly the backbone for logistics for the National Science Foundation. Our science, our efforts in Antarctica, in my opinion, rest squarely on that ecosystem that the Department of Defense provides and understand that that's not always seen as the primary mission of our services. So we are often educating and in my role, I'm, I'm not Title 10, so I, uh, I can uh, advocate at times in, in my certain statuses to, to help our elected officials, to help uh, our services understand the importance of recapitalizing, replacing these airframes and these ships. And it's an uphill battle. I, I carry the water on this in every form I can, so I very much appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today. So we're the backbone. I'd like for you to take away that we're also the most critical part of that backbone, this LC-130, and the most at risk. Within uh, a short period of time, uh, we, we could no longer have that capability. And I submit to you uh, options, because I don't like to leave you without some hope is that as the Air Force has transitioned from these type of airplanes, they, uh, they now fly something called a C-130J model, which is a little bit different. It, it looks similar, but it's, uh, the, the guts of it are substantially different. 
Uh, and as the C-130H model, which uh, LC-130s are H's, as that H model fleet in the Air National Guard transitions to J models, I see an opportunity to lay in uh, skis on a LC-130J that could be part of that recapitalization plan. So there's uh, some options for our elected officials and for our, uh, our major commands that I submit. Uh, but thank you very much for your time today, and I'll turn it back over to this mic. Thank you. <clears throat> that mic told this mic that we were going to make you an honorary mic. <laughs> I like that. The mic we'll, we'll see how this goes, and then you, you, you make the decision. Thank you both for that. Um, again, I have one, two, three, three, almost four pages of, of notes, questions to follow up on. Because we, what do we have, 20 minutes maybe, 15, 15 or so? Okay. You, you just give me the, the cutoff sign. Uh, because there's, there's, a long, there's a long list of things that um, these folks touched on uh, that go everything from geopolitics to just sheer realities of budget and uh, what I would call mission stretch, mission pull, mission tug. Uh, you both mentioned, I think, in some context, Mike, certainly more, more than the general, um, the analogies with the Arctic and what we're seeing there. I think there's, there's some similar demand signals, uh, whether it's Thule or, or, or the Antarctic that we could, that we could discuss. But to me, I, I took two, two key takeaways, and then we can go through a, a portfolio of other issues. Uh, sort of replace the planes and enhance and replace the icebreakers uh, for a number of reasons. One, the national interest of our, of our nation, um, our research endeavors, how much research, how much more research is needed to enable us to better understand what's happening. And that research will help us to inform and maybe even uh, put into place good policy. So I see this sort of continuum of, of efforts here. And the backbones are here. It's with these, these two individuals and who they represent in terms of supporting us all, whether it's search and rescue or just the basic guts of bringing a station alive and keeping it alive uh, in, in the years out. I, I don't want to get too much into the geopolitics of it all, but to, to the first question to both of you, as I'm thinking about the analogies, again, between the Arctic and the Antarctic, we talk about the Arctic Coast Guard Forum and our allies and partners in the north, and the list goes on, and, and everyone here knows that list. But in the Antarctic context, what's the analogy? If there's a problem with a, our icebreaker, if you need support, if our Coast Guard needs support, if our Air Guard needs support, share with us to the degree that you can pick up the, call, the phone and call 1-800-WHO to help you do what? Because what I have said in the North is that if a ship is in trouble, tour ship, whatever, it, even though we have an agreement among eight nations, it's still a tough neighborhood. It's the tyranny of distance. But there is a structure. There's a protocol. There's something there at least we can rely on. And everybody's got limited capacity, perhaps except one in the North. What's the analogy in the Antarctic? Because I went to a whole different list of questions here. I went right <laughs> to we've got to replace, enhance, and, and put together the, the capacities and the enabling mechanisms to support what we've heard for two days. Mike, do you want to take that first? <clears throat> sure. The, um, the opportunities are limited. There is uh, um, a certain self-sufficiency that's expected to operate in uh, this environment, and uh, you leave knowing that, and you, you operate uh, with that in mind. We have a, a pretty good... Uh, uh, support from a task force that's able to reach to other countries, uh, the convenient stations that are nearby uh, were very beneficial uh, in recent years, and, and uh, everyone shares. Uh, there, there are no um, biases and, and things like that uh, um, among nations. They, um, with the, in the interest of science at least, uh, have, have pretty good bartering systems. But there are no Arctic Coast Guard forums or fishery councils or, or those international constructs that we have in other places, particularly in the Arctic, um, that 
you can just turn to and know that the Canadians have this slice of the pie, the Russians have a large slice of the pie, and, and if it's on the you know, Lamasoff Ridge or, or near the North Pole itself, you know, it's, uh, we'll, we'll share, uh, we'll, we'll work together to, uh, to do what needs to be done. We don't, we don't have that down south. That is one of my big concerns, and, and my focus going forward um, would be to look at what we need in our surface capabilities, the polar security cutter, and, and that's going to play into the number, uh, how many we need, uh, so that we have the luxury of not being operating autonomously, not being out on the, in the Weddell Sea in the backside of the, of the West Arctic and, and being, you know, uh, one, one engine failure away from uh, a long week. So um, I, I, I think that's a great question to start off and a great area to explore. That's where we are surface side. So on the air side, when I talk about the LC-130, uh, I'm going places that only twin auditors and bazers go, uh, our options for support are limited to just that. Another LC-130 to, to rescue us, or perhaps to get a, a twin otter or bazer out to help us. So that self-sufficient self piece, I think, is key. Uh, you know, clearly the, the crews are, are set up to, uh, to sustain themselves, and we have, we have certain protocols to rescue an airplane if it goes into a crevasse, which they have gone into crevasses before. Uh, we have much better processes now. Uh, you did touch on something that I, I neglected to mention, though. Yes, the LC-13s are absolutely involved in the Arctic. And since you gave me that, that opening, I'm going to take it. We, uh, we go to Antarctica during the Austral summer for four months. We have about 400 airmen who deploy in that. They come back. We often then have a crew or two with the plane go up to Alaska or the Canadian High North to participate in exercises, uh, doing various things. Then we uh, turn right around and go to Greenland. So sometime in the May, we, we send a couple airplanes and uh, about three or four crews, and the entire support structure that goes into that between maintainers and logisticians and planners, and of course the folks that fly in the airplane. And then we train, but we also support science across the ice cap. So Summit, East Grip, some places that perhaps we haven't talked a little bit about, here, and I will tell you uh, from what I have heard from those scientists is that the LC-130 is just as vital to places like East Grip, where they do the ice core work, and Summit, as it is in Antarctica. So, I'll turn it back over to you. I, are you mic one or are you mic two? Just mic. Okay. Yeah. You're mic zero. Yeah, could be. And you're mic one. I'm mic two, I guess. We're joking and we're sitting across from each other here on the panel. I'm wondering the degree, the degree to which your specific organizations talk as you're prepping for expedition down to the Antarctic. Can you share with, with us how that happens? Sure, absolutely. So we, uh, we all, we, we fall underneath the um, Joint Task Force for Operation Deep Freeze. So that falls under uh, a major command called Indo-PACOM which uh, has many, many different uh, things it's involved with, only one of which is Antarctica. And uh, Indo-PACOM has pushed that down to PACAF, which is an Air Force two-star. So we, uh, we work under the auspices of that general officer, and uh, he doesn't come and sit on our shoulders in Antarctica, but uh, uh, sadly there is great connectivity at times. And so he's able to give us some insights on how he wants us to, to work together, but a tremendous amount of planning, and not just between the Coast Guard and the, and the air side, but like I mentioned, there, is, uh, there are Army personnel that come down. Um, they're veterinarians, and they inspect the food, <laughs> which is a little weird, but uh, that's what they do. Uh, and of course, the naval personnel that do the cargo handling, uh, and, the, and the myriad of contractors and scientists, and of course, national support. Uh, National Science Foundation support folks that are down there. So there's a ton of planning. Uh, the the planning for this uh, season, I think, started at the very, um, probably the middle of last season. It's just an ongoing process. So we we fall into that that uh, that bucket, and then uh, as uh, military folks do, we work closely together to to manage the tactical piece on the day to day demands. Mike, one. We work throughout the year to uh, prepare for Operation Deep Freeze. 
Um, Commander uh, Sam Blaze is here with us today, and we send him down for uh, about three months uh, to be on the ice and coordinate day-to-day -day things in the here and now. But meanwhile, back at the ranch and uh, headquarters, we are working on uh, deep freeze coordination for next year. Uh, it starts out with uh, obviously working with NSF on what the demand signal is going to be for cargo vessels and, and what have you, and then coordinating our, uh, our logistics uh, efforts so that um, things that I might bring down for the air crews, things that she might uh, bring down for our VIPs and everyone in between, uh, we have good communications, and it's throughout the year. It's at, uh, at our level, it's, it's, uh, it's at the, at the uh, tactical level with Sam on the ground there, uh, closing the gaps and picking up uh, anything we forgot. Mike, maybe you want to take the, the opportunity to talk about the, the, the new office. Which? Sam's office. Which is that? Polar. Your polar, polar coordination, polar coordination, polar coordination oh, oh, office. The office. Office. I'm sorry. Um, I flew too, some, too many C-130s. So in, uh, in the recent uh, past, our new commandant, uh, as the uh, previous vice commandant, was very interested in how we do this better. And we decided to take an Arctic staff, which was typically uh, a Shannon Jenkins and, and uh, his lookalike, and um, expand that. And so we got uh, uh, support from the uh, front office to build out the staff and build a polar, polar coordination office. And that office has a, uh, 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 the responsibility to take uh, the strategic, uh, the front office's interest, the commandant's specific tasking, as well as the operational commander and the uh, down to the unit level, uh, and make sure that we are planning, that we're coordinated, that we're following policy, and that there is the desired outcome, that we're, we're clear on our objectives. And when we send Sam down to, uh, to uh, the ice, that he knows exactly what's expected, and, and he closes the deal. So the Polar Coordination Office is a new construct that we've just stood up, but we're at uh, initial capability, and uh, we're feeling our way as we go. But I uh, got an 06 in charge of it, and it's, uh, it's busy. We're, uh, we're going to the Hill regularly. Thank you. But at least for me, the last day and a half, two days, there's so many inputs here. Right? I'm, it's climate, tourism, independent explorers, geopolitics, the whole list of things we, we've talked about. There are so many demand signals. It's, it's almost, think, I'm thinking back maybe five, 10 years ago in an Arctic context where we, we kept talking. I'm seeing it's, it's unfolding before us now. I'm wondering the degree to which, not just internal to, to your, your two you know, critical organizations, but how do you receive these demand signals that don't come up through an official chain? I mean, the, the tourism numbers, uh, the independent, the independent uh, explorer who's going to go there to do X, Y, and Z and then is in trouble. How do you bake that into? What, what are the unofficial signals that come in that you have to bake into the equation, even though somebody else is not thinking about them perhaps because you have, you have the orders going up and down the chain, but there are these other factors. I'll, I'll throw another one in. Maybe a particular organization, country, uh, independent uh, operator, decides that they are going to, in the next five years, increase their tourism base or other efforts by 80%, uh, which is going to have an impact on you somehow, whether it's U.S. or not. How do you, how do you get those informal? Is it through these kind of s programs, or, is it, or is there, is it other, are there other mechanisms? Absolutely. This is an awareness piece, and uh, that's why we're here in strength. There's a number of uh, my polar coordination office here and, and others, even from the uh, Commandant's Advisory Group, where we're well represented today, maybe to make sure I didn't mess up. But this is one. Uh, there are, in the, with the maritime uh, framework, we get a lot of feedback from other agencies and the industry involved in uh, mishaps and experiences uh, that, that might require a Coast Guard response effort. Uh, there are plenty of uh, um, good ideas that, that will evolve out of our attendance at IMO and discussions there. So uh, we've had uh, the National Academy of Science, we've had uh, help from a lot of industry groups that have, that have talked about resource development in high latitudes, that have talked about uh, risk and challenges of operating uh, 
uh, in, uh, in remote areas and, and challenging environments and what they expect from the Coast Guard, what they need. Those went into the requirements to build the polar security cutter design. Those, those uh, play into our, our policy making. And, and those, that's really the challenge is, is harnessing those into something that's intelligible and, and then uh, and tracking them, uh, punch list. Yeah, so I would say uh, from my perspective, um, we always talk about the military forces in this type of environment, we're a, we're a force provider. So we don't, we don't set policy. Obviously, there's safety issues that we, we uh, are very attentive to, but we don't set policy. We, in, in a sense, say it delicately, we work for the National Science Foundation. We, we support their efforts. That's what the DOD does on the ice. We support the National Science Foundation as that lead agency. And uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, yesterday's comment that we should fund the National Science Foundation more because we ask a lot of that entity, and they do not have the funding that uh, the Department of Defense has, which is why the airplanes are squarely with the Air Force, because uh, the National Science Foundation is a phenomenal organization uh, for science. <laughs> I would argue they're not a phenomenal organization for aircraft maintenance, and I think they might, they might agree with me on that. But we, uh, we too, keep our ears open, and. Uh, Whatever informal ways we can get information, we absolutely do. We work with our international partners. Uh, New Zealand is a very clear example, but also Australia and some folks like that. Uh, in the uh, New York Air National Guard, we are state, involved in a state partnership program with South Africa and Brazil. And uh, we talk about BRICS. I'm pretty sure the B stands for Brazil and the S stands for South Africa. And we are squarely there in a state partnership program with them. So we are very attentive to the polar signals from both those organizations. I will tell you, uh, from what I've seen, it's stronger in Brazil than in South Africa, but uh, that's just my, my experience. I think we have just a couple, maybe just a, another minute or two, but it, it really, yes, the, the airplanes and the icebreakers, there's other infrastructure. Can you briefly talk about the other parts of the infrastructure chain, Mike, from your perspective, General, from your perspective, that are in place or need to be in place or we need to be mindful of because it's not just about an icebreaker and it's not just about a plane. There are other parts of this uh, support chain that need to be considered as we think about the needs and the requirements of the community that's here with us today. Sure. I think um, taking a lesson from the Arctic, you could draw a quick parallel uh, about the urgency to invest in infrastructure. I, I'm repeating myself, but uh, port facilities are, are going to be vital if there is any increased marine activity. The type of uh, port facilities that would allow you to refuel or pump and dump uh, to get rid of uh, trash, you know, everything that goes into Antarctica has to come out, typically flash frozen and in tin foil, but uh, it needs to be transported out to keep the uh, ice clean. And uh, there's got to be a, a more holistic look at that. You need redundant systems uh, if you're going to put greater demands on uh, some of our bases and, um, and, and make them viable in, in any weather conditions. You know, when the, when the power goes out, people now just hunker down, light a candle, turn on the generator, whatever. But if you lose Wi-Fi, it's, it's critical. So we, uh, we, we need redundant systems to uh, ensure viability. Uh, anything to add? Yeah, so I would say uh, for any uh, complicated piece of machinery, you need a supply chain of parts to support it. So that infrastructure is very important, which is why it's very concerning with uh, the decrement of the H model fleet and the transition to a J model fleet is there aren't as many H model fleet parts available. Uh, then you throw in the fact that you got skis, which are completely different. Uh, there's even less availability, which obviously factors into how we can support the, uh, the aircraft and the mission. Uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, a, a ski aircraft can land on snow, so runways are a little bit of a different thing, uh, but we do need that infrastructure to uh, create the runways to, to, I'll say, build them, but really just you groom them, so that's very important. Uh, another thing which is really more in the scientist lane is uh, if uh, someone like Corel could take a look at um, and update our numbers for snow and ice landings. That would be very helpful to us because uh, they were based, those initial numbers many years ago were based on a C-130H 
not necessarily our airframe, the ski model. So we very much like to update those numbers because we believe that will give us more capacity to support uh, airlift. That, though, I believe is a short-term solution. So maybe that's something we we bake in to our LC-130J discussion is to make sure we also update the, the numbers so we have the right uh, information as we ask our crews to do just absolutely heroic work. If you have never been on an LC-130 slide, which is what we call a takeoff, it is a rough, rough ride. And if you get off the first couple times, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, if you're laughing, you've probably been on it for a lot longer than just two or three. Uh, there are stories of five-mile slides to take off on an LC-130. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing what those crews do. And uh, we're very proud to be a part of this mission, uh, and we're also very proud to be uh, part of the future of this mission. With that, five-mile slide. With that, uh, please thank Mike, Denise, for their time here today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for a great panel. We will now take a lunch break and reconvene at, uh, let me find my schedule here. One o'clock for a keynote by Vice Admiral Peter Godier of the U.S. Coast Guard. So please be back here in your seats at 1 p.m. Thank you. Oh, we got to hit the airport. <laughs>